Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to this meeting of the East Camps District Council Planning Committee uh, taking place today on the 1st of March. Uh, first of all, we should have a fire safety warning, please, Caroline. Thank you, Chairman. We're not expecting a fire alarm, so if the fire alarm does sound, please leave by the nearest available exit, which is the way you came in and down the stairs and the fire exit at the bottom or fire exit in this back corner. Please don't use the lift and please congregate by the barrier in the front car park. Thank you. And we then have item number one, which is apologies and substitutions. We have apologies from Councillor Sue Austin, Councillor Lavinia Edwards and Councillor Lisa Stubbs, Stubbs and we have no substitutes. Okay. Uh, item number two, declarations of interest. Any declarations of interest? Councillor Ambrose Smith. Thank you, Chair. I'm predetermined on items six and nine. I will leave the meeting uh, at, at those items when I've had my five minutes. I do intend to leave the chamber. Yes, Chair. Yeah, you do. Okay, thank you very much. Any other declarations? No, uh, and we now go on to the minutes um, of the meeting held on the 1st of February. Any members got any comment as to why I should later on sign those off as being correct? No? Okay. We now move on to number item number four. Um, as a result of Councillor Downey, uh, has uh, has left the um, Liberal Democrat group, and that has made some slight changes to the make mix of this particular committee. And, and, and the net result is that Councillor Kane is no longer a member of this committee in a, as a regular member. Uh, and I don't believe she is actually as a reserve either or a substitute. Uh, but uh, Councillor Ambrose Smith becomes a regular member of the committee and uh, he was previously a sub but he is no longer he's a he's a full member that's from that point of view and i'd just like to remind everybody that in uh april we have two meetings one on wednesday the 5th and one on wednesday the 26th uh that's basically because this room is going to be used for election purposes for the election which is on the 4th of may so I, as I understand it, there won't be a, a, a planning committee meeting in May, but effectively it'll be on the 26th of April. I hope that's fairly clear. We now move on to item number five. Uh, and if we can have the officer presentation, please. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, just having a slight. Okay, so item agenda number five, um, application 22.00816, and it's uh, MPO, and it's the modification of a planning obligation 13 oblique 00785 oblique ESO, and it's land north of Cam Drive in Ely. So you can see the location. So um, you may remember last month we had um, another MPO for the other part of the North Ely site. Um, and this is the other side of the North Ely site for Endurance Estates. So this is the site outlined in red. Here is an aerial plan. Obviously, it's not particularly great because obviously the scale of the development um, you, you can't see on this plan, but it just gives you an overall idea of where the site is. So the proposal. So it fixes the affordable housing in phase five to 40% without the further need for a viability statement. It alters the triggers in phase five for schedule seven for contributions to be made following the occupation of 150 dwellings rather than as an upfront cost and it removes the open space maintenance contribution and allotments from the list of contributions 
um, which must be paid by 800 occupations. And that's because it would have been paid by, because the North Ely has developed so far, it, um, those contributions will already have been paid. And the 150 dwellings, if they were to, um, to start development in phase five, they would literally have to pay the money straight away. So it gives them time to get some dwellings occupied before they actually, um, prior to actually, um, so that they can get the money for you ready. Um, so in terms of the assessment, it delivers 40% affordable housing still across the site and an additional eight. And that's because to ensure that there's 40% across the whole of North Ely, there is a shortfall of eight, but this would, would enable the additional eight to be captured. Um, it will pay contribution and the recommendation is approval. Thank you, Chair. We haven't got any speakers uh, there, and I think it would be a bit inappropriate to say comments from the officer because we've just finished commentating so or commenting. Uh, so, members, have you got any questions for the officer? Yes, Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, thank you. I'm slightly confused because I are, we're being asked for 100 payments after occupation of 150, but also from the County Council after 100. And in, in your presentation, I'm not clear what we're agreeing to, 150 or 100. Thank you, Councillor. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, it was originally um, 150. Um, and the County Council have since asked for 100, and that has now been agreed by the developer. So as a committee, we're agreeing to 100 rather than yeah. 150. Thank you. Any more questions from councillors? Uh, I, I, I'm not quite, quite uh, fully sure about, uh, uh, on page four, the third dot down, um, it removes the open space maintenance contribution and, and allotments, main, uh, allotments maintenance from the list of contributions in clause 17.1, which must be paid by 800 occupations. Can you explain exactly what that means? My understanding is, and I know Maggie's looked into this as well, essentially there's North Ely on this part of the site has developed at quite a rate and they are almost at 800 occupations and on that basis the contributions have already been paid for that area so for phase five there wouldn't be a need for a contribution because it's already been paid on the other phases so it's therefore not a requirement for phase five to make that contribution because it's been paid on the the previous phases so so uh, i'm reading that to say that the council isn't in any way exposed to maintenance that would be there now that's my understanding and that's what's in the agreement as far as as my understanding yeah i'm a bit confused by it being your understanding I would... that's how i understand it that's how the agreement is written and that, that's... is that an agreement that yeah. and there will be no detriment to this authority no Okay, well, if we can just make quite clear that there's no detriment there. Um, well, we've now got really open to debate, members. Is there anything which you want to debate, Councillor Brown? I'm quite happy to propose the officer's recommendation, Chairman. Uh, okay, and did I see Councillor Every a second did it? Okay, well, I think that's fairly short, but nevertheless, I think we'll go to the vote now. So we have a proposer and we have a seconder. And will those uh, members who are in favour of agreeing with the officer's recommendation, which is to approve uh, this application, please raise their hands. That's unanimously in favour. Okay, thank you very much indeed. We now move on to item six and richard we can have your proposal
Thank you, Chair. Okay, so agenda item six seeks outline plan of mission for the construction of two detached dwellings, including off street parking and associated infrastructure at site north of 44 Camel Road, Littleport. The application seeks approval for details of layout with all matter, all other matters reserved. The application has been called into planning committee by Councillor David Ambrose Smith. This map shows the location of the application site outlined in red. The development framework boundaries for Littleport are outlined in the, the thick black lines to the south and to the northwest. Uh, Camel Road is located immediately to the west of the application site. There are residential, sorry, there are residential properties located immediately to the north and the south of the application site. And there's a an outdoor horse riding arena and paddocks located immediately to the east of the application site. And members have viewed the application site and the surrounding area this morning. This slide shows some recent photos of the application sites. This plan shows the layout of the proposal. The layout of the proposed dwellings follows the general pattern of development along the east side of Camel Road. The layout includes car parking to the front and side of the, the proposed dwellings, access by two new vehicular accesses joining Camel Road. A separate planning application seeking outline planning permission for two detached dwellings on this site was removed was refused by the planning committee in September 2021. The application site was refused for the following summarized reasons. Number one, the proposed development was located outside the development framework, contrary to growth to the local plan. And number two, the proposed development failed the flood risk sequential and exception tests, contrary to policy EMV8 of the local plan and chapter 14 of the MPPF. The main considerations relevant to the determination of this application are the principle, principle of development, visual amenity, residential amenity, highway safety and parking, biodiversity and trees, flood risk and drainage and climate change. In respect of the principle of development, the planning inspector for a recent appeal relating to a site at Soham found that strict application of growth two was not justified in that case, given that the local plan anticipated housing in that location and at the market towns. The application site is located outside of the development envelope for Littleport and there is and is therefore contrary to growth two. However, the proposal is located in one of three market towns where growth is directed to by policy growth two. The site forms a gap between two development frameworks. It has been carefully considered as to whether the circumstances of this application are similar to those in the appeal decision. And for the purpose of reaching the decision on this case alone, it is considered that the circumstances are similar and therefore growth two is out of date in this case. Therefore, it is considered that the principle of development in this location on the edge of a market town is acceptable in spatial terms because the development envelope in this location is out of date and should not be strictly applied in the way growth to in, intends. In respect to visual amenity, the visual amenity, uh, the site is between two residential properties to the north and the south. The site borders an equine use to the east. The surrounding area is a mix of residential and countryside. Uh, given the, the existing development and uses to the northeast and south of the site, it's considered that the land no longer serves as a transition from built form to the countryside. The plot is of sufficient size to accommodate two dwellings without being visually intrusive, and full visual amenity impacts could be assessed at reserve matter stage if outline planning permission was to be approved. The visual amenity impacts of the proposal, including countryside impacts, are therefore considered acceptable. In respect of residential amenity, there are, there's acceptable separation distances, acceptable plot and garden sizes. There's no significant overshadowing, overbearing or overlooking impacts or other residential amenity impacts. And the full residential amenity impacts could be assessed at reserve matter stage if outline permission was to be approved. The residential amenity impacts of the proposal were therefore considered acceptable. 
In terms of highway safety, there's two new vehicular accesses near, uh, proposed near to the junction of Camel Road and Horsley Hale. The local highway authority have stated that the pro proposal is acceptable subject to conditions and there is sufficient parking and turning space provided for two cars. The highway impacts are therefore considered to be acceptable. So turning to biodiversity in trees, in respect of trees, during the course of the application, three mature silver birch trees have been removed from the site. However, the trees were not protected. The top photo shows a recent photo of the three removed silver birch trees and the bottom photo shows the site following their removal. The replacement trees could be secured by, uh, replacement trees could be secured by planning condition for a soft landscaping scheme if planning permission is granted. In respect of biodiversity protection and net gain, paragraph 174 of the MPPF requires that planning decisions minimize impacts on and provide net gains for biodiversity. Policy MP7 of the local plan requires all development pro proposals to protect the biodiversity value of lands. Policy SPD.NE6 of the, of the Natural Environment SPD states that, in addition to the provision set out in the local plan, all development proposals shall contribute to an enhanced natural and local environment by firstly avoiding impacts where possible, where avoidance isn't possible, mis minimizing impacts on biodiversity and providing net measurable net gains for biodiversity. Furthermore, policy SPD.NE6 indicates that proposals will be refused where they do not demonstrate that the post-development biodiversity value of the on-site habitat will significantly exceed the pre-development biodiversity value of the on-site habitat. National Plan and Practice Guidance states that the existing biodiversity value of a development site will need to be assessed at the point that planning permission is applied for. Um, removal of the three silver birch trees would have resulted in a significant adverse impact on the biodiversity of the on-site habitat. The application is not accompanied by any information setting out the pre-development biodiversity value of the on-site habitat or demonstrating that it would be significantly exceeded by the post-development biodiversity value. The application therefore fails to demonstrate that the proposed development would avoid or minimise impacts on, on biodiversity or provide a biodiversity net gain. Contrary to policy MV7 of the local plan, policy SPD.NE6 of the Natural Environment SPD, and paragraph 174 of the MPPF. In respect to flood risk, the application site outlined in red on this map is located within flood zone three, which is shown in the black, the blue area on this map. The MPPF requires LPAs to steer new development to areas at lowest probability of flooding by applying a, sequen a sequential test. Policy EMV8 of the local plan states that sequential test will be strictly, strictly applied across the district. As a proposed, um, the Environment Agency has no objection to the application. However, they state that development should not be permitted if there are reasonably available sites appropriate for the proposed development in areas with a lower probability of flooding. The sequential test is a matter for the LPA to determine. It is considered that there are other reasonably available sites for the erection of two dwellings within the parish of Littleport, which are at a lower probability of flooding. Therefore, the proposed development is not necessarily necessary in this location and fails the sequential test. As the proposal fails a sequential test, the proposal is contrary to policy MV8 of the local plan and paragraph 162 of the MPPF. In respect of climate change, appropriate sustainability measures could be secured by a planning condition or at reserve matters stage if, if the outline permission is approved. Turning to the planning balance, the application site is located outside of the development envelope. However, it is, a it is located in a market town and it's an infill site between existing built form. In this specific case, growth two is considered to be out of date and therefore the principle of development in this location is acceptable in spatial terms. There's been no other significant harm identified in respect to visual amenity, residential amenity, highway safety and parking or climate change. However, proposed amendment would be sited within flood zone three and the proposal fails that how to pass the sequential test as there's reasonably available sites 
elsewhere which have a lower probability of flooding. And the application site fails to demonstrate that the proposed development would avoid or minimize impacts on biodiversity or provide a biodiversity net gain. The application is therefore recommended for refusal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. We've now got a, a, a speaker, um, and that's uh, Mr. Adam Tuck, who is the agent. I think you know the rules, Mr. Tuck. Okay, you've got five minutes, so start when you're ready. Um, as the officer noted, a similar application was presented to members on the 1st September 2021. Uh, the debate at that time was very finely balanced. The application was refused due to its location outside of the development framework and the lack of information relating to flood risk. The applicant carefully considered comments made by members at that time and has now provided a detailed flood risk assessment. Since the last decision, the planning situation regarding development frameworks has changed. And following the SOAM appeal decision, policy growth too is now out of date and therefore the principle of development on the edge of this sustainable market town is acceptable. Regarding flood risk, a detailed site specific assessment has been provided. The Environment Agency have no objections, subject to finished floor levels being 300 mil above surrounding ground levels. The site lies outside of the one in a hundred year floodplain and is located outside of the Environment Agency's Fenland breach mapping and as such is at a low risk of flooding. A copy of the flood map is included in the flood risk assessment. On this basis, the sequential test is satisfied. Members have approved similar applications when accompanied by a flood risk assessment. We had hoped the two reasons for the refusal of the first application had been addressed by this resubmission. Even though this site has already been carefully assessed over an eight month period as part of the first application, the Council have now introduced a new reason for refusal which relates to ecology and biodiversity. There have been no changes to planning policy during this time. This is an outline application where only layout has been fixed. A detailed landscape plan and ecology, biodiversity, enhancement and improvement plan can either be conditioned and or covered at the reserve matters stage. There is ample space within gardens and through boundary planting to maximize opportunities for the creation, restoration, enhancement and connection of natural habitats, including the planting of native trees, including English oak, field maple, hornbeam, fruit trees in gardens and the inclusion of bat and bird boxes. The applicant has removed some birch trees. These were not protected uh, and one was storm damaged. They also backed onto the public right of way. Silver birch are well known for aphid infestation and for anyone living close to one you'll know the issues surrounding honeydew and this impacted the equestrian centre to the east. Trees and biodiversity were not mentioned at all by officers during the first application. We must stress this is an application for two self-build plots for the applicant and his family so they can build lifetime homes close to elderly and vulnerable relatives who have lived in and around the district all their lives. The applicant is happy for this to be conditioned or covered by legal agreement. As noted by the officer, no planning harm has been identified in respect of visual amenity, residential amenity, highway safety, parking or climate change. We hope members now feel able to support the application. The applicant, Mr. Clary, is here with me today who can ask, answer any questions in relation to the family need for the self-build plots. And thank you for your time. Members, have we got questions from Mr. Tuck? Councillor Jones. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, just one question. I mean, obviously you brought up the point about biodiversity not being brought up in the previous one, um, but it has been fairly much since I've been on the planning committee, uh, something that's been considered. And um, the officer told us on a site visit that uh, it's something that's considered if an application is in process. Um, so obviously you've, Taking the opportunity, they said three. We didn't know if it was four trees actually taken down at this point. And I can understand you said about the aphid infestation. Um, but do you feel this is an unfair aspect to put on when it's, to my mind, it would have been expected that there'd be some sort of biodiversity need within this um, uh, application, um, considering you've uh, amended it? Well, I think the applicant is quite happy to deliver any ecology, biodiversity enhancements, and the site can be assessed as is 
and a biodiversity net gain can be provided. So all of that could be conditioned and or provided through the reserve matters application. You seem to make, um, sorry, Chair, uh, just you, feel, you, feel, you seem to feel it was un, un, unjust at the time. I just take on your comments, you know, for. Well, I'm not sure if unjust is the right word. I think it, if for us, it's frustrating when an application has already been fully assessed through an eight month period for the first application. And it was never raised as an issue or a concern. And all of a sudden it's raised as an issue of concern this time, even though there's been no policy changes during that time. So we would ask the question, why wasn't it brought up first time round? But we're happy to address it and deal with it as part of the reserve matters or condition it. OK, thank you. <laughs> What's that? The movement of your finger, Mr. Uh, uh, yes. Um, so just to follow that up. I, I was at the previous uh, planning uh, committee meeting when this was first discussed. Um, I think there were more uh, different other problems that were uh, considered rather than just the biodiversity. I'm not sure why that wasn't, but it, it is a policy of the council, planning policy of the council to look at biodiversity issues. So I'm surprised that they haven't been um, considered. Yeah. I mean, do, did you want to consider them? I think we consider, we're always conscious and aware of adopted planning policy, but at no point through this first application or this application in front of us now has it ever been raised or brought up. And I think the first mention we had of this was back in, I had an email, for, or we had an email from Richard Fitzjohn dated the 21st of February, where the lack of ecology information was brought up so it hasn't really given us too much time to address it um and it can be it's something that can be addressed through condition and through the reserve matters Councillor Avery. thank you very much for coming and um, we enjoyed our visit to the site um as um three trees have gone obviously you appreciate that uh, we don't like to lose any trees anyway do you have any plans uh, that could help uh, either on the site or elsewhere in the village which would mediate against the loss of those three trees or three four trees three. well I think we've got ample room on site with boundary planting because you've got at the minute there's a, a front fence picket fence so we introduce some hedging and tree planting there you could have tree planting and hedge planting to the eastern boundary and even the north and southern boundaries could improve. And you've also got the ability to have smaller ornamental species and fruit tree planting in the gardens. So I think there's lots of scope here to do something and that could be covered off as, as under landscaping as part of the reserve matters. Uh, Mr Tuck, uh, in the application it refers to the fact that there were six trees on site uh, and three have been um, cut down. Uh, we went and visited this morning and as far as I can see four have been cut down. Can you tell me what the correct figure is? Mr Clary might be able to shed some light on, on this. Uh, well there was three silver birch were cut down. Uh, another tree had kind of blown over in the wind and there was a stump about that tall so that was the other one and another one was just like a little fir tree which basically just got in the way so you're saying that the, there were three substantial trees yeah uh, and the fourth one did exist oh, sorry it wasn't it wasn't fir it was a um poly sorry uh, and the fourth one was an insignificant one uh it had already blown over it snapped off mid trunk so you've seen the like the the cut off at the ground, but it would it snapped off mid, uh, mid trunk and went over on the public right away. Okay, so, so three you took down and one God took down effectively, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, that that that's fine. Thank you. Unless members, any more members have got any questions? No. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we now have. Uh, uh mm -hmm. david ambrose smith councillor david ambrose smith who is going to make a statement as a local member and then he's going to leave after he's had his speech and if there's any questions for him 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members, uh, for allowing me the time to talk on this particular subject. Mr. Tuck has actually said the majority of what I've actually got written here, so I'm not going to repeat that because he put it across, I thought, very well, as did, I thought, the yeah, officer put the argument across. Unfortunately, we came to wrong different conclusions, but uh, I thought the argument was put across fairly. Thank you very much for that. The only points I'd just like to reiterate is... Uh, there's two really. The, the first application, the summary at three at 7.36 of the last, the previous, in the minutes of the previous application, uh, the summary says uh, it was outside the, the, the main concern is because it was outside the build area. That was the main concern. That's what it was. And these other additional items have been added since then. The other point just to uh, bring to the attention, yes, it was sad to see the four trees come down. Uh, I agree on that, but uh, I will say that uh, the Port Leisure, which I have a connection with, uh, are prepared to allow the planting of up to 18 trees on their land, uh, on its land, uh, to accommodate some of the biodiversity needs and so forth. That's all I have to say. Any questions? Questions for Councillor Ambrose Smith, members. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not sure the officer will necessarily find it relevant, but just for our information, um, how far away is the um, three fields? Field? So it is in a general locality. Yes. Here, yes. Councillor Wilson. You, you suggested that there's some uh, extra trees might be planted on a, a council, a parish council land. No, no, I didn't. It's oh, not sorry. parish council land, it's the port leisure land uh, with them for 125 years. Uh, they have permission from the county council to put 100 trees there. So far, we probably have 50. But there would be extra trees. Would you expect the developer here to uh, pay for the cost of these extra trees? I'm just putting that forward as a proposal, as a, a way out to get this application through. Any more questions for Councillor Ambrose Smith? I understand, Councillor Ambrose Smith, you volunteered to leave the room and we'll make sure somebody comes and tells you when this item is dealt with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, has the officer got any comments to make? Uh, no, Chair. Okay, any questions for the office? Uh, Councillor Trapp. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, how, how wide is the plot itself? I'm just thinking about, and um, what's the length and breadth of which I would say? Have you got an idea of that? Oh, I don't have the details of that, I'm afraid. Right, because it, it, judging from these uh, drawings, it does seem rather tight for both tr for extra tree planting. That's what I'm worried about. Um, and yeah, okay. So you, you don't, there's no, there's no. All right. Thank you very much. Jones. Oh, sorry, thank you. Um, can I just check? So um, obviously, uh, David Ambrose, uh, Councillor. Ambrose Smith has offered um, options for tree planting. Um, can it be included within a, for off-site um, mitigation um, within the development? So um, to provide that, it would need to be a legal agreement to secure it. Um, we can't condition that the trees are, the replacement trees are provided on um, lands that's outside of the control of the applicant um this it sounds like is is sort of private land sort of within somebody else's ownership so there would need to be a legal agreement with i'd assume the applicant and the landowner party to it to sort of agree that um so i think we haven't had any um documents submitted with the application to to suggest that that's an option and to um suggest that that's actually um 
practically an option um, with, you know, with, with the agreement of the, another landowner. So um, I don't think it's something that we can necessarily consider today from my point of view. Um, I'm not sure how that would actually be secured. I was going to ask you to speak, Councillor Brown. I was just saying that my question was the same, so. Okay. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, uh, I was obviously like to give a brief opportunity. Um, so, um, two more questions, if I may. Um, do we feel there's enough, um, obviously what Councillor Trapp was intending, is there enough um, placement, uh, enough space within development to Mit provide suitable mitigation, in your opinion? Uh, I'll take a sort of yes or no, rough act. I don't have to be an exact. Well, the, I mean, that's a requirement for the applicant to demonstrate it. I mean, I, 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 can't, I can't possibly make a judgment as to, you know, I mean, the second reason for refusal regarding ecology is, is based on the fact we haven't had any information about what the, the pre-development biodiversity habitat was with the three trees that have now been removed being present. Um, so now they've been removed. We don't know sort of what that pre-development pre habitat value was. So we can't convert it to. Can you square it? Is how would they square the circle in terms of doing that? If if they put what if they was to provide a statement for you in the future, yeah, as part of the planning application, um, what would they do? Have to do a guess on what the four trees was worth, or is there any? basis to evaluate what that biodiversity was worth the four trees worth that you're considering well the, the, there's, there's still two sort of similar you know the similar trees still there so i'd imagine if, if 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 in the future there was an application where they'd engage with an ecologist that could provide a report potentially based on you know the, the, the ecology value of the other trees it, you know I, I would i would assume that that would be the way that they could get a, a reasonably accurate measurement of that not so much on that following um obviously they talked about the um the drainage was the other issue obviously it being a flood zone three and there's other sites available um it does seem quite a good site as an infill site from, from what i've been seeing um they suggested the sequ sequential test um has been mitigated by the information they've provided a flood uh flood risk plan um with suitable drawings um I take it they have been said, yeah, obviously your report and you've seen it. So you feel that is not adequate or how do we? Yeah, so the flood risk assessment submitted with the application in terms of the sequential test, it states that um, it, it, base, it, it, it states that um, the application site is located in an area where it's defended by flood defences and um, it basically says that the sequential test is passed for that reason. Um, that 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 that's not correct. So, in terms of national planning policy, um, flood defences cannot be considered as part of the sequential test. Um, so that's that's incorrect. Um, so on 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 that on that basis, that the the flood risk assessment is is not accurate in terms of saying it passed the sequential test. Um, it doesn't demonstrate that at all. Um, just on the subject of um, the uh, flood zones as well, I have had some additional clarification from the Environment Agency about their comments, which I would sort of like to read out. Um, so it says that the site is at low risk of flooding in the event of a breach of the defences, but at high risk of flooding if the defences were removed altogether, and that's what the flood zones are based on. Breach scenarios only look at how an area would be unindated in specific circumstances. Our Fenlon model indicates that the site is located just outside the area shown to be at risk of flooding in the event of a combined breach of the use washes in the EDU's flood defences and a failure of the ERIF sluice in a 1% annual exceedance probability event. However, the Fenlon model is based on a number of breaches occurring at specific locations along the defences. Multiple breaches, other combinations of the breaches or different flood flows may give different results. In addition, only a small number of breach locations or failure scenarios were modeled for the 1% annual exceedance probability event 
when a 20% allowance for climate change is included. As such, there is some uncertainty in the outputs of the model and the site may be at risk of flooding if the likely events of climate change are taken into consideration. By using the undefended scenario for the squinch test, you are avoiding that, that uncertainty. The planning committee can be assured that you are adhering to national planning policy as well as your own local plan. That's what the Environment Agency have provided in sort of clarification to their, their comments. Councillor Trapp. So following on from that, and in fact, the question I was going to ask about the increased severity of possibility of flooding now. I think that that that's what the statement there by the environmental agency is it you said there was an increased possibility of that happening so the one percent is not really one in a hundred years really is it anyway it's it's that's a, a statistical thing but it's not quite true well i i, I think one of the main points of it is that um is also that it's their comments are based on a breach of the defences that are there, whereas uh, we need to consider um, national planning policy requires that we consider flood um, flood risk with without taking into account any defences, and they're saying that basically the site is at high risk of flooding if those defences are not there, and that's that's how we should be applying policy in terms of flood risk. Councillor Wilson, and then Councillor Edwards. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> when we travelled in the bus to this site, we travelled past a, a site which we had given planning permission for um, some months ago, and it was well underway, where the house was actually built on stilts. Uh, would that, is that sort of building possible to eliminate this uh, risk of flooding on this particular site as well? Would that be a possibility, do you think? So the the first part of um, considering sites in flood zones should be that you apply the squench test first. So the, that wouldn't, that that is not a consideration for the squench test. So that doesn't resolve the issue of uh, making this proposal pass the sequential test. That, that would be part of the exception test, which only applies if the sequential test is first passed. Um, I, I, I can understand what, what you're saying, that you, you, the, there might sequentially be a better place, but um, uh, self-build housing doesn't happen very often in, in East Cams. We know several places which have got planning permission for self-build and never happened at all. So when we've got some, somebody wanting to do self-build housing, one is naturally inclined to go along with it and uh, extra sites for self-build housing um, are in Littleport, you say, that they're, they're sitting there waiting to go and uh, would be the same sort of values as, as this. Is that what you're saying? Councillor well, Avery. So, sorry, did you want... I beg your uh, pardon. Sorry, do you want a res response to that? Well, you're, you're saying that there are other sites which are, are available within Littleport, which are the same sort of size and uh, availability, you think? Well, uh, what what I'm saying is that the, the, the I've, I've I've not I've not made an assessment of what other sites of the same size and availability within Littleport there are. What I'm saying is that there are reasonably available sites in Flood Zone One within Littleport. We we we've approved lots of houses um, as part of as part of allocations in Littleport. There's no sequential reason that's been demonstrated in this application um, as to as to why there are no. Um, no other sites reasonably available within Littleport for for a couple of houses to be built out, you know, to justify what why why they would you know in this case they're being proposed in the flood zone. Thank you very much indeed, um, Richard. You've introduced this uh, extra uh, statement from the Environment Agency. Um, most of which went over my head, I have to say. Um, but I just wondered whether the applicant had had an opportunity to, um, before, to actually um, ha have seen this statement. And is it possible, Chair, um, just asking through the Chair, whether our applicant could possibly have an opportunity to respond to the new situation or the evidence or statement that has come through to the committee? Because I probably don't think they've heard this before. 
So, so this is just clarification I've sought from the Environment Agency regarding their comments. So this is this is me requesting from them some clarification because I don't think their comments are clear. The applicant and the agent has completely the same opportunity to to seek clarification of any quantity comments from the Environment Agency should they should they wish to. So, I mean, I'm I'm personally quite happy for them to come and respond if they want to. Um, I just think it would have been in the report had it been. Uh, received before the report was written. So I've so I've sought additional clarification from the Environment Agency after the report was written. So I don't, it doesn't it doesn't change anything in the report or my reason for refusal. That that remains the same. But I've sought additional clarification because I thought there may be questions from members around sort of Environment Agency comments that that they would need clarification on. So. Councillor Avery, it's my understanding that we should consider what's in front of us and what's in the agenda uh, and, and the report that's in the agenda and that it would be inappropriate to do this, but I would be prepared to be uh, advised by the planning manager or our legal expert, but my understanding would be we should judge what's in front of us. Is that correct? Um, I think so, Chair. I think the... the the reason why Richard read out the extra clarification he received from the Environment Agency was because he was just seeking clarification on how he's applied the sequential test in the report. And from what I understand, they've said is they agree with his assessment of the sequential test and how he set it out. So I think all he's done is just give you a little bit more background as to why he came up with the recommendation he's come up with. So on that basis, I don't think it's really the kind of information that's going to get any further if we shared it with the applicant. Well, we've got Councillor Ambrose Smith and then we've got Councillor Trapp. Thank you. More of a comment, really. Um, if it's a comment, we, we, we will get well, to debate. Is, we will get to debate. Is it a question for the officer? Yes. Okay. Yeah. In September 2017, Cambridgeshire County Council opened the new school complex, having invested something near £40 million. This will hold, uh, this will house uh, in excess of 700 children there. Surely, if they had the confidence to build this um, facility almost over the road from this site that we are considering, that must say something for their um, decision that this was a safe place um, to build such a school. So I wonder why sort of two or three fields away, we are worrying about building um, two um, houses, which my understanding is uh, they will probably be chalet bungalows. That means they would have a refuge space in, on the upper story. Um, I mean, how do you feel about that? Well, the, I mean, a school is completely different to, to a house um, and flood and, and flood risk is considered differently for different uses. So I, I acknowledge what you're saying, but I mean, this, this recommendation is based on national flood risk policy. It's based on East Cam's local plan flood risk policy. Um, which it both indicate that this application should be refused on flood risk. Councillor Trapp. Uh, it's, it's coming back to these dimensions. I mean, the footprints are approximately 115 square metres each. And it looks from the plans as if it's going to be either two storey or one and a half storey. So it's quite a substantial buildings we're having there. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of concerned about how far they stretch to provide any reason for biodiversity. And I, I take the point about moving the biodiversity, so offloading it somewhere, but surely it should be rather in the same location as well. What do you think? It, it doesn't need to be in the same, in terms of replacement planting to provide some additional biodiversity. It, it, it doesn't need to be planted in the same place, but I think... I think members just need to, you know, be assured that uh, I, I think they, members just need to be sort of confident that if recommending 
re recommending approval for the application that they that they are confident that the uh, site can provide some biodiversity net gain um, within within the site um, that that will sort of mit mitigate against the the trees that have been lost and the pre development biodiversity value of the site. I mean. The, the application doesn't demonstrate that so it is very difficult for me to 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 sit here and make a recommendation on that um which which is you know really the whole reason for refusal reason too um councillor jones just one final one chair um if we was to overturn this particularly with regard to flood um the, the uh flood position um would this have a significant effect on the local area and other planning um applications in the future could you make a, a best guess i can appreciate it. it's not an exam. i think if members were minded to support the application and find that there was no harm in terms of flood risk um i think they you would you would need to uh consider consistency of applying national flood risk policy and East Cam's flood risk policy in the local plan, um, which is clear that um, the sequential test needs to be passed for development to be um, approved in flood zones. Um, so, I, and based on the previous application as well, where members refused the previous application on flood risk, I, I, I think members would also need to think about sort of what the, yeah. the, the reasoning for the previous flood risk reason for refusal now now being addressed and, and, and why that is. Yes, I, I think this will probably be your last question. <laughs> Am I right in assuming that should members uh, decide to uh, agree with your recommendation there's nothing to stop the applicant putting in a new application with answers to the or with suggestions of how the flood risk can be uh, contained and also that the biodiversity can be dealt with as my understanding would be that there's no reason why they shouldn't but can you confirm that there's, there's no reason why they can't put another application in and particularly in terms of the biodiversity reason for refusal then um it's probably the, the the simpler one to to tr try and resolve but in terms of the flooding issue um they they would need to provide a sequential test that, that demonstrates that there's no sites reasonably be available within flood zone one to to provide these houses within within little court so it's it's uh, i'd say more difficult for them to demonstrate that but i mean they, they can put another application into to to try and do that if, if they wish to. Councillor Brown, no, it's no finished. Well, in which case, we're now going to move on to debate. Uh, and members, it's up to you. Uh, you've heard what the officers said at uh, length, uh, and you've, you've heard uh, Councillor Ambrose Smith speaking as local ward member. So members, over to you. Councillor Jones. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I get the feel I'm with, I uh, feel that members of similar um, opinion than I am. Um, we'll wait and see if that is. Um, obviously, it does seem to be a good infill site. Um, I'm sure the bet net biodiversity can be overcome. Um, the issue is this flooding. Um, I would have liked to ask one more question of the officer to see whether about the flood plans, but um, that does seem to be the sticking point um the uh, it, it's, uh, it's flood defenses um i do feel we will be going against our own policies if we start overturning it on it um however much i'd like to um i, I would hope there are some ways of overcoming it so this site can be um made available in the future i don't know if they can if they were to raise the the level of the land in the future if the flood yeah, um, drawings would actually change. I don't know how quickly they are um, in that one, but um, I feel why we can't overcome the flood issue in a sequential test, we are going against our own policy. And reluctantly, I'd probably end up supporting the, um, the officer's recommendation on this particular one. Councillor Brown, and then it'll be Councillor Wilson. 
Thank you, Chairman. I'm going to wait and hear what other people say before I decide which way I'm going to go. I'm looking back at the minutes from last September, and we were very clear as a committee that the two grounds for refusal were because it was outside the development envelope. And in fact, I remember saying we fought long and hard to get our development envelopes, and therefore we shouldn't go against that. And the other one was that a flood risk assessment had not been submitted with the application. Not that it didn't meet the sequential test, but that we hadn't had a flood risk assessment. We have had a, now had a flood risk assessment. And the Environment Agency seemed to think that they've no objection provided there's conditions. So I really am in two minds on this one. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Um, it seems to me that uh, if the Environment Agency says no objection to the proposed development, but strongly recommend that the mitigation measures are adhered to, in particular, that the foot finish floor levels are at least 300 millimetres above the surrounding ground levels. And we know that uh, a house a little way along that same road has had exactly the same thing and, and has, in fact, uh, managed to achieve that, I think that that probably solves the flood risk thing, because after all, the Environment Agency haven't said this is a no-no because of the uh, flood risk. And the other thing, of course, is that it's surrounded by other houses which are actually slightly lowered in area. And, uh, you know, the flood, if, if there was a flood that flooded this particular piece of land, it would also flood the neighbouring houses as well. Um, which wouldn't be a very good idea, but that does mean that the flood defences would are likely to be uh, preserved or improved during time to protect the other houses as well. Yeah, as far as the um, biodiversity, well, we would normally insist on biodiversity at, at, at reserved matters application, and we haven't got this is an outline application, not a reserved matters detail application. And as long as we make sure that there's strict biodiversity. Uh, conditions at that time, which might involve um, uh, a section 106 for payment for alternative trees somewhere else, or it might be involved in how the, the biodiversity and the sort of hedging and things that, that will be required. Um, I can't, I'm sure our officers are capable of making sure that that, that does, does happen. And therefore, as it seems, this is a, 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 a between some other rows of houses, does seem very unreasonable to not allow, allow two um, houses to be built there. Um, and uh, I, I'm of the opinion that we ought to be supporting self-built housing anyway, um, as we seem to get very little of it in East Cam. So um, I would uh, like to op oppose the um, uh, officer's recommendation and recommend that we actually approve this application with those conditions. I'm making a note of what you've said, Councillor Wilson. Thank you. Councillor Every. Well, that's very timely because I was going to say that having heard uh, both Councillor Brown and Councillor Wilson and not, not wishing to repeat everything that they've said, I'm in total agreement with uh, what, what has been said and I would like to second uh, Councillor Wilson's proposal. I would just like to say, Councillor Every, that I'm very concerned about going against our policies and it could open up a floodgate. <laughs> um, it, it, it could open up something and I must say I'm, um, I have concerns about going against our own rules. If I could just return on that, Chair, we do consider every application on its individual merits. Thank you for reminding me, Councillor Every. And we have Councillor Trapp. Thank you. Um, I think, if I may say, Councillor Wilson, the house on stilts is actually on the Prick Willow Road, not in that road. It was a very different, and it was an existing house anyway that was being demolished and replaced by another one. It was, but it was far away. For me. Um, the thing about this biodiversity offsetting by putting trees somewhere else or hanging gardens or whatever kind of biodiversity is, I mean, how far away can one go? I mean, can one go and plant a tree in Scotland? So I'm, I think it's the site that's important, the very local site that it should be uh, adhered to, not somewhere where one can offset it uh, because one could. So 
I think I, I mean I'm I'm like David uh, Councillor Brown in two minds about this. Yeah, it seems a good place. I'm surprised, and the, the answer Councillor Ambrose Smith thing about um, the the school being built. Actually, I think the school is a bit higher, and and I think one meter height difference on those fens makes an awful lot of difference to flood risk. Actually, um, but it's difficult to tell whether the school was one meter higher than this one, but I think it was. Um, so I'm I'm in two, still two minds about it and I'd like to hear other people's views. Christine Ambrose Smith. Thank you. Um, I understand the concern around the biodiversity. Uh, however, the Clary family I know are notable gardeners and I feel sure that if they are able to build these two houses. The gardens surrounding, surrounding them will be full of shrubs and bushes and all sorts of things. And we can, of course, condition all sorts of uh, hedgehog tunnels and bird boxes and all the other things that come with them. Um, surely also is not beyond the wit of us in, uh, in the planning department um, to, you know, raise the level, or to request that the level of the building is raised sufficiently to mitigate against potential flooding. I, you know, we, we go around this district and visit all sorts of um, uh, application sites and so frequently the mention of 30 or 40 or whatever um, height is thought to be a good thing, you know, is conditioned. So I can't believe that we can't get over this. And I would certainly, um, if it comes to a vote, support Councillor Wilson's uh, suggestion. Thank you. Councillor Trapp. I'm sorry, uh, Councillor Amber Smith, but surely it's nothing to do with what the occupants can or cannot do. It's nothing to do, we, it's we're looking at what the actual proposal is and not who is doing it. Therefore, we, we and one of the things is, I think I remember quite clearly last time it was said, um, it's not, there was a thing about suggestion about the family moving in and thing. we said that's not, that's not relevant. It's actually to do with what is available and not what the capabilities are, whether they're gardeners or not gardeners. Yes, but this is a general debate, not a conversation between two members, but well, please carry on briefly. Well, again, a planting scheme could be requested to be approved that would um, cover all the points that are felt to be necessary. As a condition. As a condition. Thank you. Um, well, we have, as far as I can see... Chair, can I uh, offer a bit of advice? Of course you can. So, okay, Chair. Um, I think I just want to clarify a couple of points and then suggest maybe a third way rather than let's just approve it now or refuse it now. Because, first of all, biodiversity is not a reserve matter. Landscaping is a reserve matter. But the actual biodiversity assessment you would need to know before you granted outline planning permission. So... I'm afraid you can't just wait to see on biodiversity. And on the point that uh, Councillor Brown made about the minutes of the previous meeting, uh, Richard's just confirmed to me that the reason for refusal of the last application was about the sequential test and the policy. It wasn't just lack of flood risk assessment. So that is a consistent theme through the two decisions. Um, so, but if... For those that are minded to support the application, I think you would need to bear in mind that you need to override the sequential test, regardless of whether or not you think there's a flood risk. So if you're gonna, you've got to make that leap if you want to grant planning permission. You, you can't be, that's just a policy matter that Richard's clearly set out. So can I suggest that what is an other option is that you could defer the application uh, we could work with the applicant to get the best possible flood risk mitigation in the scheme as presented. We could work with the applicant to seek biodiversity net gain on or off site through some of the ideas that have been put forward. That may be in the form of a legal agreement and then present the application back to committee at a later date so that those two issues are satisfied as best you can. But 
I would only recommend that you do that if you're minded to overcome the sequential point, because if we come back and we do all that work and then it gets refused on the basis that it's still within flood zone three, then that you, you've just got nowhere. And you've also put the applicant into a lot of expense to get to that point. So in order to make that decision on deferral, I think the members would need to sort of have in mind that you, you're just going to go, you're going to try and override the sequential test to get to that point. But if you did defer it, we could, we could do those two aspects and re report it back to you. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Councillor Wilson. I'm quite prepared to change my uh, proposal to, to follow the officer's recommendation, because I think that we will have to uh, accept that this, the sequential test uh, is going to be a problem, but we, which we can overrule if necessary. But uh, if, if we can get through those things and just defer it, that would make life easier for us to agree the rest of the other items. Okay, so you want to defer. You want to defer, and you were going to be second by Councillor Everly. Would you be happy to defer? I would prefer to defer than to refuse. Okay, so that's one there. Um, I was I was going to propose that we accept the officer's recommendation. Uh, as yet, I haven't got a second. Though I, I don't know if I have. We will deal with uh, we'll deal with the. Uh, the, the deferral from Wilson and Everly first. Uh, my my proposal, if there is a seconder, is to go with the officer's recommendation. Do I have a seconder? Yeah, sorry. Of uh, Mr. Ellis, um, is it likely to be able to be overcome? If they raise the land level, would that beat the sequential test? With a no, because the sequential test is locational and policy based. But but what? So if you were, if the council were minded to grant planning permission, and what I, what I'm suggesting is you could get the maximum best flood risk mitigation within the development because the yeah. environment agency have already said there's a relatively low level of yeah. flood risk here. But it but and we could work with the applicant to provide more clarity on what that is as well as do the biodiversity assessment and work with them to, to provide you with more certainty about how that could be delivered but you if you're going to grant permission for this you always have to override that but, policy because it's as, as yeah. richard's pointed out that is a policy position that's regardless of what existing flood mitigation there is or what proposed flood mitigation is it's, it's a locational sequence i mean we could work with them to do a, a sequential test but i mean we've thought about that and we can't even work out yeah. how you'd even begin to do it now that that is really what i agree with the sequential test in this respect and i'm wondering how you're going to overcome it uh, i suppose my view is how the lead lo local authority update their would they update their plans if you've new got a height a land level height um for it to be above how would they they've got a general plan to sit and say this area is going to flood but that's based on a, a we, sea level we think it? gavin might be able to Add something to that. Yeah, if, if I can, Chair. Uh, just just to clarify, so the obviously the, the sequential test is about avoiding the risk of flooding in the first instance, and that's how that's very much set out. It's, it's a very strict approach. If the applicant is looking to challenge the mapping, the flood risk mapping, as you say, through raising land levels or going a bit more forensically into it, they can challenge the EA's mapping and their assessment. So obviously, the mapping at the moment indicates that rivers and seas flooding but there's also drainage flooding and, and it's quite obviously quite complex but if you you can you can challenge the ea's mapping it's not a it's not in you know it's not an instant fix uh, but you can go down that route and liaise with the ea in order for them to review their their mapping which may lift it out of flood zone three through negotiation or even flood zone two as well because obviously we'd be looking at flood zone one in the first instance um and obviously that's very much where where, where the applicant could take it if they wish to do so. I think, as you say, raising land levels, unfortunately, you would probably get quite a bit of pushback from the EA on that basis because obviously it, what it does is it fails the second part of the exception test, which is preventing flood risk elsewhere. You'd have to demonstrate that you're not just pushing it down the road or pushing it elsewhere. So there's quite a bit of technical work that would be required and involved around that. I think just to add to that, obviously, in terms of once the sequential test is met, there are two parts of the exception test. Obviously, the first one is the wider community sustainability benefits 
that it's got to deliver, but then also obviously managing the risk as well. Okay. Okay, then um, we've got now, we've had, I think, the opposite opinions. Uh, before we go to the first vote, which is the Wilson Abbey vote, um, I would like to know if there is a seconder for my proposal, which is to accept the officer's recommendation. No. Okay, thank you, Councillor Trapp. So, I would allow the uh, members to say what their wording is, why they're going against the, uh, my proposal is to, is to agree with the, uh, with the officer recommendation. Uh, no doubt Councillor Wilson or Councillor Every will be able to put some words together at work. Um, and I think we're proposed deferring it on the grounds that we would like the officers to um, uh, arrange to find an alternative way of getting at the biodiversity, to, to find a solution to the biodiversity loss um, uh, with, with the applicant and also the flood risk on that particular site um, work, work with that as well. So um, it's really a question of allowing the officers to mitigate the reasons for uh, which of the officer suggested we should uh, refuse it for. Well, that, it's not very clear, I'm afraid, but you know, I'm sure the officers can put that into better words than I've put it. Seek a solution to overcoming the um, significant Yeah. Sorry, I was going to make a suggestion, that was all. Um, uh, we'd like to uh, defer the position, so uh, to give an opportunity for the applicant to make. Um, sorry, we'd like to defer the um, application, give an opportunity for uh, the uh, planning officers to work with the applicant in order to overcome the suspension test, um, and in order to give the applicants time to um, supply um, a net biodiversity um, statement to yeah. accompany the application. Do we feel that? Are you happy with that, Councillor Edwards? Uh, Chair, if I could just ask for the legal situation for, um, for the benefit of members, but also uh, our applicants, where does that sit with if there was a refusal um, that there could be an appeal? Sorry, Sorry Chair, if, if, if you deferred the application, then the only appeal that you could receive is an appeal against non-determination. So, um, and I doubt they'd do that. If, you, if you're minded to be positive about it, yeah. um, I think I just want to clarify what, I take what Councillor Wilson said. I think what we're suggesting, isn't it? We work with the applicant to provide the maximum best flood risk assessment. I don't think we can challenge the mapping the sort of approach that we would look because that's out of our hands that's a decision of another authority work with the applicant to see if there's a biodiversity net gain assessment that can be done on the basis of what Richard was talking about in terms of using existing trees as a model and then come up with a proposal that achieves biodiversity net gain which might involve a legal agreement and some off-site arrangements and then present the application back to committee on that basis. But I think those, if, if that's the committee's mind, you, you've, you've got to, you've got to, you've still got to get over that hump and say, if we're going to do that, and you that happens, we, we, we're going to override the sequential argument because otherwise, it's just a refusal again, but only one reason rather than two, and that's a bit of a waste of their time, I think. And in an appeal in that situation, you know, you, you don't want to be there. Okay. Um, how long do we need? Obviously, there is, bearing in mind there is a local election coming up and we will not be necessarily be here in a few months' time. I know that favour, uh, you know, I, I'm in favour, you change your mind slightly on this one if we can overcome it. Um, how long before we'd need to give a reason? Well, I think, I think it's, it's iterative, isn't it? It's, the applicant's going to need to provide more information. We, we need to consult bodies on it. I, I, we can't say how long that's going to take. I'm afraid. Okay. 
just letting other members know I'm in favour of passing this one if we can overcome and get the, um, uh, you know, the flood risk up a little. Firstly, Chair, a second, could I confirm that I second the proposal that has been proposed? I, I'm, I've got you down. I was going to just finally ask you before we got to the vote, Councillor Ebery. So are we clear what Councillor Wilson and Councillor Ebery are proposing? Would you like to read it out? Or would the planning manager like to read it out? So it's a deferral. So the officers work with the applicant to present the best possible flood mitigation measures within this planning application. It's not a deferral to overcome the sequential test. That's not really a possibility. And to work with the applicant on a biodiversity assessment for the site, a realistic biodiversity assessment for the site and what measures would be needed to compensate that on or off site and if off site through a section 106 or other mechanism and then report back to the committee at a later date when officers are satisfied that those two elements have been delivered. The motion is passed with five votes in favour and two votes against, with no abstentions. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Uh, so item number seven, uh, application 22012284. Full. It's a full application for the erection of eight dwellings and associated infrastructure, access, garages, etc. Um, the application has been called in by Councillor Harris. I believe he's speaking in a short while. Uh, I'm just um, refer members to the update that was circulated yesterday, just in respect to the slight change to the description of development, removing reference to phasing. So just looking at the site, uh, the site's located, as you can see here, sort of in amongst Prick Willow, um, comprises an area of agricultural land, um, actually allocated in the local plan under PRK1 for development for up to 10 dwellings. Um, as you can see, from the aerial photograph, um, there's dwellings sort of immediately sort of northwest of the site, uh, immediately opposite from the southern side of, of the road there, obviously with um, open countryside extending um, eastwards. And there's a, an agricultural barn uh, to immediately north of the site there. Um, the site is in flood zone three, uh, in def uh, defended uh, flood zone three. Um, so just uh, a note, this is a sort of street scene photograph, uh, which shows the sites as you would have noted today when we visited. Um, so the photograph there is taken from Putney Hill Road. As you can see the area sort of brown overgrowth uh, is, is actually sort of the, identifies the site quite well, demarcates it. Um, as you can see, open countryside over to the right. The dwelling to the immediate left is Long View, uh, which is the closest dwelling to the application site. And you can probably just see from that photograph, and you'll remember from the site visit, um, how levels differ quite substantially from the highway and the adjacent land, uh, with that land sort of at an average of about 1 to 1 1.2 metres uh, below kind of road level, below AOD. 
you'll notice the reeds in the foreground, which essentially run along that ditch that, again, you would have seen as part of that uh, the site visit earlier. Uh, and these are sort of street scene photographs from across, across the way, uh, where you would decamp from the bus earlier. Again, you can just see the dwelling of Longview on, over to the left. And then the photograph at the bottom um, is essentially viewing back upwards into, into Prick Willow. So the main considerations are principle, um, access, general sort of layout, scale, appearance, and landscaping, uh, general amenity impacts, biodiversity, and flood risk and drainage. So just in terms of principle, um, the, as I said, the site is allocated under policy PRK1 for up to 10 dwellings. Um, the proposed, the, the policy uh, requires um, an element of affordable housing, um, but uh, as set out in the report uh, and as per uh, the previous application, it's considered that that's generally because 10 houses were envisaged where national policy would require the delivery of affordable housing. This application and that before it was for eight, and therefore it's not deemed reasonable to secure affordable housing in this instance. Um, the Obviously, the other criteria set out there in respect of uh, housing mix, um, the housing mix in this instance is deemed to be acceptable as set out in the report. And there are other, obviously, considerations in respect to visual impact, access safety, uh, accessibility, flood risk, and any other sort of relevant policy considerations. So notwithstanding the uh, site allocation, uh, the principle of development has also been established, as I mentioned earlier, through that previous permission, which is extant still, which was for eight single storey dwellings. As you can see on the plan there, uh, showing the sort of the, the fixed arrangement, it was a full application. Uh, and that was the style of uh, bungalows proposed at that time. And you can see the layout uh, also, which, although slightly different from the scheme in front of us, is not, not significantly so. Uh, generally access is sort of in amongst in a region of the same sort of area uh, and the arrangement uh, is, is not significantly different either. So officers consider that this uh, the, the uh, extant permission is a significant material consideration in assessing this this latest uh, application. So just in terms of access, uh, the location is agreed with the local highways authority, as I say, it's not substantially different to what was approved previously. It's considered that a suitable visibility can be achieved. Uh, the access will need to be uh, run across that ditch. So a culvert will be required and details are required to be agreed for that in the interest of maintaining uh, adequate drainage and also the integrity of that access. But it's uh, generally considered that the access uh, complies with local and national policy. So just in terms of sort of the general visual considerations and, and layout, uh, so the, the layout sort of follows uh, the shape of the site, it's quite a square site, um, and you've got that sort of perpendicular access arrangement directly from Putney Hill Road. It's proposed to be a six metre wide shared surface arrangement, which is considered to be appropriate in this instance, given the sort of low, low level traffic that would be likely to run along it. Um, it achieves adequate on-site parking, acceptable levels of private amenity space having regard to the policy, uh, and then again, um, suitable uh, access arrangements for our refuse collection, and that would be subject to that uh, indemnity agreement. In terms of house design, they're one and a half story, that's six, meter, six and a half meters in height to ridge, um, plus uh, obviously the flood risk mitigation, which I'll come on to shortly. Um, as you can see, there's two main house styles. You've got a, what I call a T shape over to the left and a H shape over to the right. There are two dwellings uh, proposed in the H shape. They're four bedroom dwellings. The remainder are all the same three bedroom T shapes. And you can see the proposed brick uh, and roof tiles there on the, uh, on the scheme as well, which are considered to be uh, good materials to use in that location. Um, and, uh, and obviously generally the, the design is considered to be of, of, of uh, acceptable um, high quality design. As you can see, the first floor is managed through a, a mixture of roof, roof lights and for those T-shaped dwellings, a single dormer window as well. So just in terms of uh, the scale, so the scale of the, um, of the development uh, is one and a half storeys, and it has regard to the um, sort of site levels, uh, particularly also those previously approved ridge levels. I'll come on to that in a, in a short while. Um, the, the actual levels on this site are, the, the finished floor levels, I should say, are going to be substantially lower than what was previously approved, which um, the officers consider do, does give it some scope for um, a slight increase in scale on these dwellings. Um, 
the design and materials are considered to be high quality, as I said, and it's considered that appropriate landscaping, you know, soft landscape in particular along those site boundaries could be secured, which would actually um, create an enhancement to that uh, access into the, into the, um, the settlement. Um, through a robust sort of soft landscaping scheme. So in general, it's considered that the uh, layout scale appearance and uh, proposed landscaping would accord with the sort of general local and national policy aims. So the scheme is considered to afford future occupiers um, with high levels of amenity. There's good spacing and separation between the dwellings and the arrangement orientation of windows, et cetera, it would prevent sort of any serious overlooking uh, and again, sort of due to the sort of scale, uh, overbearing, overshadowing impacts would be um, to the minimum. Um, in addition, the garden sizes are considered to be appropriate, as well as the general uh, maneuverability around that site, which would, would create a high level of amenity for future occupiers. Uh, we do have an objection in from the adjacent uh, property at Longview, um, which is set to the west. Uh, who raised uh, a number of concerns, but in terms of amenity, uh, sort of looking really at privacy, noise, outlook, overshadowing and loss of light, uh, pollution issues uh, along with that scheme. The pollution elements are sort of covered in the report. Um, it's not expected to sort of, in terms of its future operation, day-to-day -day residential use would generate much sort of significant pollution issues. Um, you know, in terms of noise or odour, for example, but it is recognised that construction can generate um, issues and therefore construction environment management plan is proposed to be secured and also a restriction on construction hours as set out in the um, conditions. Um, in terms of uh, uh, sort of uh, the uh, impacts on Longview itself, obviously the previous scheme is a significant material consideration as, as I set out earlier in, in terms of officers' thoughts on this. Uh, and obviously a, the comparison of impacts of that scheme um, uh, versus what, what is now before us is sort of deemed appropriate to, to do that assessment. Um, the previous scheme was not considered to, to compromise the residential amenity of, of any occupiers adjacent, particularly those of, of those of Longview. Um, if I just move on, if, if you can just see the, the, the slide that's in front of you there. So we have um, obviously the approved scheme and the, the sort of the relationship between the proposed dwellings and, and long view, about 21 meters uh, house to house um, from plot one to, to long view there. Uh, and as you can see that bottom plan, due to the flood risk mitigation measures proposed previously, it actually would have raised land levels um, quite substantially on the site. Uh, to actually bring those bungalows up to a similar height to um, to long view uh, and actually the the land levels themselves were actually raised slightly above that of long view uh, according to the street scene photo that was uh, approved um so obviously that, that's there's, there's a bit of a change to that if we just look at the next slide um so the agent has provided um uh, some some measurements in terms of the current position what's been approved as an extant permission and what's being proposed now and you can probably just see from that slide the red line the top red line is the ridge height of long view um, and where that strikes through the proposed dwellings now um, the green line is the approved ridge heights for the uh, previous scheme the extant scheme and obviously you can see that superimposed onto the proposed dwellings now um, and the reason is, is because the floor levels of these proposed dwellings are only proposed to be raised 500 millimetres above existing ground level, rather than around about 300 metres above road level, which is about 1.2 metres, um, even or 1 to 1.2 metres higher. So it's considered that the outlook uh, by Longview would be not dissimilar to that that's already approved. Um, having regard to the sort of the sun path, uh, overshadowing, etc., it's considered that there would wouldn't be a significant impact on the occupiers of Longview in that regard. Um, and therefore, uh, it's not considered that there is any conflict with the immunity policies of the local plan. In terms of biodiversity and, and ecology, the application is supported by a preliminary ecological appraisal and an arboricultural methods statement. The council's tree officer considers actually the scheme is an improvement on that previously because of the position of some of the houses relative to existing trees off-site, particularly on that northern boundary. Um, in terms of biodiversity, there are protection measures that have been identified through the PEA and also potential enhancements, which are proposed to be secured through condition. So it's considered that it's likely that this scheme could 
uh, quite adequately achieve a net gain in biodiversity. And that's really because previously, uh, or the, the PEA that's been submitted identifies that the site, due to its previous use or current use, um, it, it probably offers quite low biodiversity value. So in terms of flood risk and drainage, which I appreciate you're probably a bit tired of uh, having, having considered that for the last hour and a half. So the site is in flood zone three, um, defended as, as the, the previous site. However, as I said, it is allocated uh, in the local plan. So sites that are allocated through local plans have already gone through that sequential test consideration. And therefore the sequential test is not needed to be passed. It's already automatically passed as a result of it being allocated. Um, the application is supported by a flood risk assessment, which has been updated to the previous one, which identifies that in an absolute catastrophic event and we have drains backing up and, and obviously flood defences failing, we would get flood depths here of up to about 420 millimetres. And therefore, uh, the, the recommended mitigation is to raise floor levels by 500 millimetres rather than raise the entire site to road height, as was previously um, proposed. Um, as you can see, the, the flood evacuation plan has been submitted and, and been accepted. So in the event of a flood, um, notwithstanding first floor refuge, uh, that there will be a, a plan to, to indicate to future occupiers how they can exit and, and leave the site uh, to, uh, to, to take safe refuge. But as I say, nonetheless, this scheme is considered to be slightly better than the previous in that um, before, I think there were roof lights in the roof for people to be able to climb up into the roof space and out and essentially uh, get on their roofs. This time we'll actually have an area of first floor accommodation where they can place possessions in the event of uh, you know, a worse scenario than, than what is predicted currently. Um, it's considered to secure details of surface water drainage, um, purely just to make sure that it's appropriate given the, uh, the site conditions there. So in summary, it's considered that the development sort of largely complies with policy PRK1. Um, it already benefits from permission for eight dwellings, as I say, significant material consideration. The visual impacts in general and the layout is considered to be appropriate for this site and uh, the, land, the soft landscaping would enhance that uh, entrance into the village. Um, it's considered that high levels of amenity would be achieved, uh, both for future occupiers and the uh, amenity of existing would be safeguarded. Net gains in biodiversity also can be achieved and that the flood risk uh, issue could be adequately mitigated on the site. So the recommendation is for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we've got uh, an objector, Brian Gabaldi, if you'd like to come and speak. I'm sorry if I got your pronunciation wrong. You've got uh, five minutes. Okay. Go Thank ahead. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members. Um, can I firstly draw your attention to the photographs previously supplied to the committee? Um, these were taken from the French doors in my lounge, showing the view over the proposed development sites and from the edge of my drive from the proposed edge of the site, looking towards the front of my bungalow. Uh, the bungalow houses the lounge, large hall, disabled friendly cloakroom and the kitchen diner to the front, to the rear of the bedrooms, uh, ensuite and family bathroom. Um, everyone who has visited the bungalow, including some councillors, remarks on how light, airy and warm it is. This is because the sun rises to the left of the bungalow from the front and moves slowly across the front until around 2 to 3 p.m. There are no windows in the lounge to the side nearest the road, as you've seen from your own photographs. And I'm sure you, those of you who were on my drive this morning, uh, noticed it as well. Had you knocked on the door, we would have happily invited you into the lounge so you could see the uh, effect that this de development would have had, will, will have uh, yourselves. Um, because we get this much light and heat in the living quarters, 
it would be completely lost if this proposed development was granted. Um, there's case law on this in Cambridge in the last 10 years, and it would leave us no choice but to take the matter to court to seek compensation, as the cost to heat and light the bungalow would be prohibited for us on the pension. And when this development was previously requested, as been shown, um, it was for eight four bedroom, two storey dwellings, each with detached double garages. And the then de developer was obliged by this committee to change the plans to single storey bungalows. From the figures that have just been given, uh, which I do slightly disagree with, um, to raise the level of the field to the level of the road, then go 500 meters, uh, 500 centimeters above that to start the first floor. Plus putting in the buildings, we're talking on your own figures or the officer's own figures of eight to 10 meters above what it is now. It would put us much, it would put it much higher than the windows of our bungalow. In fact, it would put it higher than our roof. It's still unacceptable as the requirement by planning is for the level of the field being raised, etc. cetera. Um, the field is also a floodplain with water on three of the four sides. The excess drainage and surface water with the increased ground height would put us all at greater risk. Um, and I am speaking um, at the request of my neighbors on this as well. Um, we are currently not in the floodplain as, as we have the, the um, plans supplied. Um, however, this field is the floodplain. With these, this development, it would put us, and I'm including the bungalows in Corner Close on this, it would put us at much greater flood risk. And yet we have no escapes to second story or roof windows or escape hatches because by the deeds of our properties we're not allowed to we're not allowed to go up to a second story or put any windows in the roof moving on to another thing um, with regards to the road and i can speak with some authority on this Putney Hill Road is a rat run for vehicles between the A10 at Littleport, Ely, Mildenhall, and the A142 at Soham. It is used by the emergency services whenever there's a problem on the A142 because it's easier for them to come through Queen Adelaide, down through Prick Willow, and down out through Great Fem Road to get to the 142. And where most of the accidents appear to happen on the 142, they can usually get both sides by doing that. The road between the junction with Main Street and the start of this development, as some of you have seen yourselves, is a sharp hidden bend. Hence, it's put into our deeds that there's a line of sight for vehicles. Can I, can I say you have exceeded the five minutes? Could you wrap up uh, as soon as you can i possible. will do quickly um we have a line of sight so we can't put anything over a meter high uh, across the front garden and the road the proposed access to this site is almost opposite the access to high sports and club uh, social club which has many vehicles accessing and leaving during events both during the day and night we have figures from speed drop activity that show traffic in one direction for one hour alone is always between 250 and 594 vehicles. It has gone over 600, but that was during times of problems. I'm afraid you have gone over That's six fine. minutes, so I, I must call an end to it. That's fine. Thank, you, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Have we got any questions? Councillor Jones, I think. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so obviously you are aware there is um, planning permission already granted on this field at the moment, as I see. Um, and obviously that was yes. talking about the higher heights that you were talking about earlier. This one does seem to be a lot lower level, the roof line sort of 
when I say in line with yours, looked to be about half a meter from what I saw or something around about 500 mil roof line difference, that type of, or is it a bit more than that? Sorry, I can't remember your figures here. I, didn't put I disagree with those figures. And um, I'm sure if, if you were amongst the policy this morning, standing on, on my drive, you were looking down at my bungalow um, and you would have seen the height of the, the guttering, the eaves. And um, to some degree, we have to take the civil engineers and people have looked at that and they've looked at the height levels and they've taken levels from benchmarks. And, you know, we can only go on what we see and what we believe to see. And obviously building control will ensure that, you know, they'll meet that. Um, I mean, given that the height, looking at the lower level, um, it seems to be, do you feel, I can see you've lost an amenity and whichever development goes ahead, you're going to lose that amenity of, um, of your field view, unfortunately, I'm afraid that. Um, do you still feel that this level would give particular overshadowing, because given there's 20 metres and the sunshine? I'm From looking at the pictures you've got on the tree, sort of the shadow, um, given that that's probably on your entrance, uh, towards the entrance, it, it doesn't seem to reach your, your lounge or anything like that. No, no, but bearing in mind where that roof level is going to be in front of us and where the sun rises over there and comes across there, um, that's when the sun is at its highest uh, temperature, heat, um, light. We're going to lose all of that in, in the best part of the day. Okay, thank you. Can I also just confirm, um, I'm looking at the drawings and we didn't know, so it looks like you've got um, your window faces out onto the front garden. Have you got a rear garden as well? Um, it's difficult to see from that drawing or any lines or um, I didn't know what's behind the garage if you have a secondary garden. Well, the bungalow is behind the garage with a, a side entrance to the to our back garden, which is very small. Right. So you've got to, yeah, just there's no lines on there. And obviously you've got properties behind to have a right. That's mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Very crap. Thank you. Um, you're concerned about the loss of light. Um, I presume that plan is north south. Is that orientated into the north? Um, so the first, the house, which is of obviously the one just on the on the left, would be, I don't know how far away it would be, I don't know, probably about 20 meters. But that would be east sun. That would be only the sun in the morning, in a, on a sunny day, on a summer or spring day. You'd be getting the full sun from the south. Yeah. Could you turn your light on? So wait a microphone on while you're talking. President, then come on. Um, yes, if you stand at the front of my bungalow and look to the left, at a 45 degree angle, you're basically looking at where the sun rises. It then comes across the front of the bungalow and by two to three o'clock in the afternoon, then it's starting to move around the side of the bungalow. So between six o'clock in the morning and two to three in the afternoon, it's all in the front. Mm. I'm just, I'm just, sorry, I'm, just, I'm just looking at that diagram, which I assume is north-south orientated. Uh, yeah, it, it is. That's, that's set so north is is is, is north. Yeah, I'll, I'll just skip quickly to. I don't know if you can see it on the aerial photograph, there, but that is that is true north. That aerial photograph, the way that's set up, so you can see sort of long views, orientation relative to the field, uh, and then obviously yeah, the plans uh, do do sort of reflect that. Yeah. Right, so actually the the sun would be it's only something that nine o'clock be as a uh, Greenwich mean time that would be affecting that. Anyway, okay, okay so I'm just, just going through this and, and you've got more expert advice. We, haven't, we didn't have a compass there. We didn't have an altimeter. So I'm not sure about, but I'm just trying to get you to say what you think about that. Right. 
Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Any more questions? No. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Uh, we have uh, Anthony Smith, the applicant's agent. Mr. Smith, I give you, if you need it, only if you need it, an extra minute uh, to, if you need to battle on a bit, you can do. Um, thank you, Chairman and members of uh, and members for allowing me to speak this afternoon. I'm the agent speaking on behalf of my client. This application has a full support from the planning officer and there have been no objection from highways, parish council, tree officer, flood authority or environmental agency. <clears throat> the application is being held at the planning committee due to a call in by Councillor Harries due to the likelihood of flooding, poor road conditions, loss of amenity to neighbours due to excessive building heights and the damage to the street scene. It has been stated within the call-in that there has been strong objections from the City of Ely Council. However, from the consultee, the City of Ely have no concerns to this proposal put forward or any of the ones that were put in pre previously. Plan permission has already been established on this site. The site is within the development framework of Prickwallow and is allocated for residential development of up to 10 dwellings within the local plan policy PRK1. The approved scheme has a full, the approved one, the single storey dwelling, has a full scheme of three bedroom bungalows, whereas this proposal has six three bedroom dwellings and two four bedroom dwellings. The market housing mix suggested for East Cams is one bedroom is zero to 10 percent, two bedrooms 20 to 30 percent, three bedrooms 40 to 50 percent and four bed plus um, 20 to 30 percent. Given that the approved scheme offers only 100% of the three bed dwellings, the latest proposal offers a mix of 75% of three bedroom and 25% of four bedroom dwellings, which is considered to be closely aligned with the ambitions of the latest housing evidence and accords with policy PRK1 by providing a mix of dwelling types. The proposal has a shared use access road of six meters wide and suggested as suggested by the highway officer. The proposed building heights have been carefully considered on this application, as shown on the approved street scene drawing number 662007. The proposed ridge heights are 390 mil above the approved scheme. And I've got that over there if you want to see the justification of that. Um, a detailed site survey was commissioned prior to the design stage and its established levels were set to ensure the minimum to minimize the building heights. We feel that 390 mil is not excessive. The dwellings have been designed with large offset distances and no first floor windows that can overlook the existing neighbors or cause any overshadowing or loss of light. All flood risk messages are incorporated within this scheme and all reports have been provided. A detailed landscape landscaping scheme will be submitted via a condition to ensure the perimeter is com complementary to the adjacent developments. In accordance with the framework, planning policy should be granted unless any adverse impacts of doing so would significantly and detrimentally outweigh the benefits. This proposal makes much more efficient use of the site and would make a modest but important addition to the housing needs of this district. NPPPF paragraph 68 states that small and medium sized sites can make an important contribution to the meeting of the needs required of the area and are often built relatively quickly. The site is allocated for housing within the local plan and already has plan and approval. This scheme has been carefully designed and does not cause any harm to the area and this reflected by the support from the planning officer and I ask for you to um, support a recommendation of approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just stay where you are, if you will. Uh, members, Count, uh, Councillor Jones. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the gentleman before um, uh, alluded to potential uh, additional flood risk, I take it from surface water flooding. Um, I haven't gone through all the particular documents, but I mean, um, is there relevant? It looks as though there's a drop on that and suggesting that the flood water would run away from that. I take it there is a drainage. 
um, plan in place uh, for surface water drainage that will a not affect the client and take it away from the current yeah exactly that so we've had a flush risk assessment uh, carried out that's all been done we've actually got with well, the actual approved scheme as you can see there it, they've actually they're actually infilling so at the moment we are about 1.8 lower in some areas on that site than the road whereas the approved plan was 500 mil above the existing road level at Puntley Hill obviously as you can see there having that increase of level will be more of effect on the neighbours uh, whereas our scheme is basically 500 mil above the existing ground levels in accordance with the flood risk assessments but the previous scheme didn't have a topographical survey so they didn't know the heights whereas we've done a topographical survey so we knew exactly what the heights were and that's what we've based everything on thank you um looking at the um slopes of the roofs i noticed the bungalow is quite a shallow slope whereas the proposed buildings are quite a a steep slope and i think that is looks like and and the, also looking at the previous one uh, proposal the there was a number of garages between the first house and longview so in both cases we're now increasing the height and we're moving it nearer the existing uh, bungalow of, of longview which is going to make an effect um i'm surprised that you do have to have such a steep slope there um why, why do you have such a steep slope there it's to get the head height for the rooms upstairs um obviously the previous scheme we did have the eaves height higher but in obviously negotiation with the planning officer we've dropped all the eaves they're actually lower than the adjacent property at uh, longview as you can see on the street scene um yeah uh, there they go so obviously their uh, soffit level at the moment as you can see in red at the bottom is lower well it's actually higher than our eaves level you also mentioned uh, that these designs could be done quickly but i noticed that planning approval was given almost one and a half years ago and so nothing has happened we're still um waiting so how quick is quick that's well planning permission lasts for three years isn't it so it's all dependent on the client i know this client particular wants to crack on straight away because it's actually a new client to so the person who had owned the land before have sold it on and this is the client who wants to develop it Okay. So, and obviously planning wise, you've got the three years to do that. Otherwise you lose the planning. But also you, you gave us a sort of a, what the percentages of each sort of type of house should be. And I'm surprised that you're all going for three bedroom and four bedroom. Um, which seems to be a bit of there's not smaller houses, which is also quite necessary, I think. Um, so it's a big, it's a big it's development of big houses, really, isn't it? Yeah. well it's actually a three bedroom um and obviously if you look at the housing mix suggested for the east cams yeah. they actually say the 40 to 50 percent want that and obviously the four bedroom is 20 to 30 percent uh whereas realistically we are in line with the two bedroom which is 20 to 30 percent for the four bed as well so they are pretty much the same well there's no two beds there no no this development at all. yeah thank you very much any, any other questions for the applicant? No, thank you very much indeed. Chair, I'm very sorry to ask you this, but as the Lord Councillor, would you put your permission to speak? I, I thought I'd given notice to speak, but after the meeting began, I said, Councillor Harris, no one would ever ignore you. You're on my list, and in actual fact, you were due to be invited this millisecond. You have five minutes, and will you turn the microphone? I Thank will you. not need five minutes, that's for sure. Um, I visited this um, this site first a year and a half ago, just after the original planning permission was granted, and I, I felt then it was a mistake, and I was bitterly angry with myself for not having called it in. Um, back then, which is why I was glad to have the chance of at least uh, obliging the committee to look at this carefully, 
and have a debate once more. My main concerns about this are really a series of red flags. It's not that I felt that everything um, was completely unacceptable about it, and I am aware that it was included in the plan of 2015, but every single response has been unenthusiastic. The Environment Agency has given a large number of provisos. The, um, the drainage board, and by the way, I should point out you have the wrong name in the papers. I know you consulted the right board, but it's actually Middle Fen and Mir, not middle level commissioners. They have hedged their response around with provisos, and I'm not hearing anything that says their concerns have actually been definitively dealt with. There is a genuine concern um, in the minds of other residents, not simply Mr. Gibaldi, um, that they will have their properties actually inadvertently placed on a floodplain. And I'm also deeply concerned that nobody is taking seriously the issue about the speed watch um, work on, on the road outside. I mean, we, we know that you have to do work on the culvert to give any kind of access to this site. Anyone who's driven down that road, and I imagine most people here have done that, will understand that it can be exceedingly hazardous. The speed watch activity in which Mr. Gibaldi and several other residents in Prick Willow uh, took an active part, clocked serious problems in this area and the likelihood of um, potential fatalities if the amount of traffic is actually increased. I do not see that the planners have taken this into account at all. They've gone to the county council, they've had um, a, a, a no objection response, which greatly surprises me from the highways authority, because I would have thought this was a, a requirement for mitigation of a considerable kind. I feel that there is a danger of people thinking this is a case of nimbyism. I genuinely don't think it is. I spent time uh, walking around the space, uh, looking at it carefully, and thinking that when the prevailing plan, the 2015 plan was prepared, it might have seemed entirely reasonable to put some houses on this patch of land. But a lot has happened in the past eight or nine years. We now have serious, um, the flood risk has increased. We are moving between periods of drought and periods of, drought, uh, of, of flood that is actually exacerbated by the state of the ground owing to drought. Um, I have been until recently a member of the Internal Drainage Board at Caudal Fen, so I know that there is a serious sinkhole and a major problem that is threatening a development in the middle of Ely. There is no reason to believe that something similar will not happen in Prickwillow. And finally, I had the experience of advising some residents in Prickwillow about uh, a plan to build a single house, admittedly on Main Street, where there were many, many, many objections and they had to go through three different rounds of applications in order to protect the street scene on the grounds that Prickwillow is a very special place and is treated with great seriousness in terms of street scene and amenity. And I'm kind of baffled as to why this not very distinguished development in an entirely unsuitable space has been waved through because it was put on the local plan nearly a decade ago. Um, and and I, as I said right at the start, there have been several red flags. It's not so much one single big issue that renders is unacceptable. It's just everything about it is suboptimal. And, I really think it should be refused. Thank you uh, for your attention. And thank you very much, Chair, for allowing me to speak. I truly appreciate it. No, will you just wait where you are, Councillor? Uh, members, have you got questions for Councillor Harris? I know Councillor Jones who wants questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Harris, so obviously you're aware that there is planning information on this currently at the moment. 
I am fully aware of that. That was really the first thing I wanted to say. Um, I, I was mortified uh, that owing to my own stupidity and inexperience, I had not called in the first okay. application when I should okay. have done. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we are in the unfortunate position that, you know, the car issue that you're talking about uh, will exist. They were just, if they used to exercise their right on this one. Um, so really, we have to be looking at this one rather than, I feel, many of the points that you put up. Um, I, I felt that this new um, plan that they've got seemed to be at a lower height, seemed to take drainage away from the um, existing properties and the fact that it was set lower down. Um, I can appreciate, obviously, you've got concerns about the land and things like that. Um, do you not feel this is a better proposition than the previous one? Have you have you made any sort of determination on that one? Compare, I mean, given that we're going to have potentially either one or the other, um, do we feel that this is a better one than the other uh, existing plan that could be implemented? Have... I don't have an expert opinion on that. I, I think that, as is always the case, uh, detailed negotiations between developer and planner uh, lead to variations and one hopes that those are improvements. But as the agent told us earlier, the original applicant, I, I would not say he was not serious, but the original applicant sold the land on. So in a sense, this is all moot. We don't know what was in the mind of the original applicant. We only know what is in the mind of the people who came up with this plan. And I would urge you to look at this. I would also urge you to look at what the drainage board says and what the environment agency says, because this is not an absolutely clean bill of health that's being presented in here. It's marginal at best. Thank you, Councillor Trapp. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Harris, do you know what public transport exists in Prick Willow? That's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, the issue of public transport um, is a vexed one. My belief is that there is an intermittent bus service. I'm ashamed that I can't give you a precise answer to this, given the fact that as several councillors here know, I've had the honour to be on the bus and active transport committee, but I do not believe there is adequate public transport out to Prick Willow right now. Um, I think that the assumption is that everybody will have at least one car on this development at least one car there are two parking spaces per dwelling yeah but also the four bedrooms probably have three or four cars so i'm just saying that one is now totally committed to cars from this location more or less i i think your surmise is correct at the same time it is the world we live in there is no point moaning over the fact that 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 people don't have um excellent public transport that that means they don't need to own cars this is this is not how we live right now and and i i accept that developments like this will require cars i would just therefore ask the committee to look at this issue that has been flagged by the resident concerned who has himself stood on the road with a speed camera night after night along with many other residents checking what um um, what, what is the reality of transport there? They understand this a lot better, dare I say it, than the uh, the highways team at the county council, simply because they live there and they live with it day after day. Thank you very much. Mr. Gavaldi, it is, uh, you've had your opportunity to speak exceptionally exceptionally you can come up and have, if you've just got a couple of sentences to say or answer some query please do so your question sir there is no public transport in Piccolo it ceased five years ago and there are many people in Piccolo who don't have cars elderly people and many young thank you very much thank you uh, members, any more questions for Councillor Harris? No. Nope. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Now we've got any comments from the officer. 
if yeah. you if you want you yeah thank, thank you chair if i may that that'd be that'd be great thank you um i think just just going back to the um agent's comments just in terms of delivery i know there's obviously concerns about speed of delivery on this just just to clarify the recommendation is for a two-year implementation condition rather than the standard three and that follows uh the, the recommended action plan that was um essentially generated as a result of a housing delivery test where we identified that you know there are opportunities to perhaps speed up delivery and therefore rather than impose the standard three-year implementation condition the recommendation is to restrict that to two to in, in order to sort of really incentivize uh, delivery so hopefully that clarifies that point um i think just in terms of uh drainage issues which which were raised just a short while ago um, I take on board the, the IDB, the Internal Drainage Board, um, the authority there. If that's incorrect, I apologise. Um, but I think in terms of their comments, they really they really centred around the use of soakaways for the site um, as, as and essentially have set out that if they consider it's appropriate, uh, then it should be OK. Now, subsequent to the previous planning approval, uh, which is set out in the report, uh, the applicant did uh, some infiltration, infiltration testing to understand whether soakaways would be achievable and the lead local flood authority actually agreed the infiltration testing undertaken was acceptable so it does indicate that soakaways um, are likely to be achievable on that site but obviously belt and braces we've recommended a surface water drainage condition to ensure that we have oversight over actually what, what's finally being delivered there um, I think in terms of sort of the environment agency comments um, Appreciate that they perhaps weren't exciting comments um, or enthusiastic, but they, they, they generally take a quite a, a strict approach to their comments. Um, they've essentially reviewed the FRA, the flood risk assessment, and agreed with the recommendations in terms of the mitigation. They've advised the LPA how to undertake this sequential test, which is something that we didn't need to do because it's a, an allocated site. Um, and then they've obviously um, recommended the flood resilient measures uh, action plan uh, and obviously foul drainage needs to be managed, which again uh, are secured through planning condition. So in terms of in terms of drainage issues, as you as you've identified, the site is lower than than is uh, than was previously approved. Um, and obviously with the flood levels now um, indicated to be lower than previously modeled, I mean, it's not considered that flood risk uh, would be a significant issue to either occupiers of the site or those adjacent. Um, in terms of highway safety issues, obviously it sounds as though there's an existing issue with highways. I don't know the specific details of that. The Highways Authority haven't raised anything. Obviously, if there is an existing issue in terms of speeding, then those concerns should be directed through to the Highways Authority, uh, perhaps the Parish Council, if they haven't already done so, we'd want to, to liaise with them about what can be done to improve uh, issues there. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the local highways authority have considered the development for eight dwellings, and I'm assuming have considered that it won't exacerbate the issue to a to a degree that warrants refusal in this instance. Um, and obviously, again, there are conditions securing visibility and the height of any structures that, that could otherwise compromise visibility uh, in the recommended conditions. Uh, that's all I've got. I hope that's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and members, have you got any questions? Councillor Trapp. Well, I assume you'd be first. Yeah. Well, I don't have to be first. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gavin, isn't it? Yes, it's it, yeah. Um, I was going to ask, how, how far away are the buildings from the long view? Is it possible to bring up that? Uh, or, yes. Or for you to say so? They're 21 metres as previously approved. So 6.5 height would be an angle of 16 degrees, or if you want radians, it will be. Um, what well, in, in terms of at, at the angle, the angle is 16 degrees, which in summer, when winter is is about where the sun actually gets to. Um, yeah. All right, so that's that. Is will it be an adopted road for purposes uh, no, of? No, it's not proposed to be an adopted road. So. All the bins have to be wheeled out to the edge of the property. Uh, well, as set out in the report, uh, the proposal is that the applicant will, uh, or the owner of that, that that land, or the occupiers will sign an indemnity agreement to enable our refuse lorry to enter and, and exit. Um, the tracking that's been provided demonstrates that's achievable. Obviously, it is for the applicant to get that indemnity agreement signed to waive any damage that could be caused to that surface by the council. In the event that that isn't secured, 
then there is a bin collection point uh, proposed. I don't know if we can see it somewhere around here on the site. Just see if I can do that there. Uh, so that residents can can wheel their bins to a presentation area, which was, will be within uh, carrying distance for our refuse teams. Obviously, the ideal scenario is that the refuse team will enter the site um, and obviously be able to collect from uh, adjacent properties. Will the will that be a, a section one hundred six um, consideration or not, or will that be part of the a condition? that they start indemnity? Well, obviously conditions should be secured if they meet the tests, if they're reasonable and necessary. Obviously there are two options here. One option is for the, the um, owner to sign that indemnity agreement, which from a, a sales point of view may be, may be beneficial rather than residents having to carry their bins. In the event that isn't, there is still adequate provision for residents to present their bins for weekly collection. So it's not considered necessary to secure uh, that level of detail, but obviously it's in your gift to propose to do that if you wish to do that. One, one further question. How, I, I actually missed the previous planning committee meeting, which had, had this, because I was in Portugal. Um, how, um, how, what size were the bungalows? What, how many bedrooms were they? Uh, they were all three bedroom bungalows before. Thank you very much. We have uh, David Ambrose Smith. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Trapp asked my questions, actually. Thank you, Councillor Trapp. Yeah, I don't give, you don't give me much of a chance, but thank you very much indeed. Just to follow on from the waste side, which was, it was the waste, uh, you're hoping that the HGV vehicle will actually go onto site, uh, that thereby assuming that the culvert and so forth will be made up accordingly for HGV vehicles. That was... Uh, an assumption because if it doesn't happen, the HG vehicle will be uh, parked outside on that on the bend effectively because the road comes round. There's a big blind spot. I walked to the site just to look at the traffic. Uh, I just wonder, would you ask highways if it, if you can't get the vehicle onto site? Would you ask highways to comment again if this provision isn't allowed to get on the vehicle onto site? Uh, well, we could we could uh, theoretically secure a refuse collection strategy to, to sort of get that sort of confirmed up if you've got concerns in that regard. And therefore, that would entail a, a submission of details. And therefore, we could then consult with the local highways authorities to whether or not they'd be in agreement with the rec with the refuse collection strategy. Uh, so that that's a, an option. Thank you. I didn't really understand what you said. But my concern is, sorry, I'm not, I didn't really understand what you said, but my concern is if the vehicle is parked at, the HG vehicle is parked outside there, it is, especially with the volume of tra tra traffic, which was mentioned, and we saw it actually today, uh, it, it would be a dangerous spot for not just the, well, for mainly for the operators, our, our, our operators. So uh, I think it's a thing we should discuss perhaps later, Chair, when we debate the subject. Thank you very much indeed. Members, we now move on to a debate. Uh, anybody got one more question? What this is, is this question to offer? Well, I think, we're, I think we're up to six already, Councillor Crabb. Please, if you would, just one more. One more. If we refuse this application, then we would be back to the previous application. That would, that, that, that would be in enforcement. Uh, well, obviously, we, we, we can't guarantee that that development would ever come forward. But obviously, as I said, it's a significant material consideration that there's a fallback position there in that the, um, develop, that development could come forward, yeah. Well, it's given, been given approval, hasn't it? Yes, but obviously we can't control implementation. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to debate. Any, any comments that anyone would like to make? Councillor Jones. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, obviously, taking that fallback position, um, my personal opinion is it seems a much better scheme, really. We're getting bigger houses. I mean, I know it's um, lower down and these houses seem to be a little bit more in the depths of it and perhaps more prone to flooding in terms of uh, compared to the previous uh, um, version. Um, I feel it will have less effect on the neighbours um, in this one. Um, it seems quite a good uh, development overall, and um, I'm leaning in favour of approving this um, in line with the, um, the officer's recommendations. Is that a proposal or are you just a comment? I'm happy to prepare, propose. 
Okay, thank you very much. We'll make a note of that. And now we move on to Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chairman. I've got so considerable sympathy with the uh, residents of Longview. If I was living there and had had that view for a long time, that's what I'd be wanting to keep. However, as we all know, that isn't the way the world works. Um, I can see no planning grounds to go against the officer's recommendation, and I'm happy to second Councillor Jones. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Chair. I, I'm inclined to agree. We're really stuck, really, with this because there's a there's already a planning a activation approved for this site, uh, and it was in the plan anyway. Um, the fact that there's only eight houses means that there's no affordable housing. But Prickwell is a difficult place for affordable housing with no public transport and very little uh, local facilities, um, and I don't really like the idea of tandem parking because I think it won't really happen. And I think that people, there'll be cars all over these little streets. And I think it's great pity that the streets aren't adopted because that would make life simpler for, for the people living there. But that seems to be the way of the world at the moment. <coughs> and uh, I, I agree that a, a refuse vehicle parked on Pulteney Hill Road would be very damaging indeed for safety because, <coughs> excuse me, there will be a lot of uh, farm vehicles and big vehicles going up and down Pulteney Hill Road on a regular basis. So um, it will just cause a lot of lot of problems. Thank you. Um, so I think though, um, we're going to have to support it because we haven't got an alternative better solution and we've got no good reason for refusing it. Councillor Ambrose Smith. David. Bill, I come back. I, I'm in favour of the application, that's for sure. We've mentioned, I mentioned earlier the waste collection. That, that is a big sticking point uh, with me. Uh, and I would like Gavin to explain the possibilities again to me uh, about actually ensuring that it is on site as opposed to off site. That is the collection. And if there is a possibility, we could actually say that in, in re our recommendations. Okay, thank you. So, um, as I said, one, one suggestion could be that um, via condition we secure a refuse collection strategy, which needs to be implemented prior to occupation, for example, and that collection strategy could be an agreement uh, or proposal by the applicant to build the roads to a standard that to withstand 26 tonnes in line with our refuse collection um, and to sign an indemnity agreement. Uh, we could ask for that sort of through a condition, I guess, if, if that would make you more comfortable. So that would be a refuse collection strategy that we would seek to secure um, essentially prior to, to occupation and obviously have that implemented at, at point of occupation. This is debate. We've, we've been past the questions to officers. Well, it was a question to you, Chair, really. Uh, One apologies. more go. Sorry? One more go. No, to you. To you. Do You're questioning me. Yeah, I'm questioning you. Could we, in this recommendation, uh, or in fact to, the, to Councillor Brown, who proposed this, uh, in this recommendation, could we actually ask that this condition is actually put on to the recommendation uh, regarding the waste collection? I would have thought that Councillor Jones is, uh, is um, proposing to go with the officer's recommendation. If Councillor Jones wants to make any uh, refinements or additions to that, that would be appropriate. Councillor Jones. Chair, yeah, um, in discussion with my uh, uh, co-seconder, um, uh, we, we do agree and happy to include that amendment um, to, uh, to look at review about the waste collection strategy to be part of the, and other, any other delegated responsibilities, of course. i just make sure that Caroline has got, do you understand what Councillor Jones has just said? Uh, yes, I believe you're proposing that you, um, the officer recommendation with an extra condition to secure a refuse collection strategy with the precise wording delegated to the officers. And you're happy with that, and also uh, Councillor Brown's happy with that. Absolutely. Okay, so in which case I think 
I've got a fee, Councillor Trapp. What a pleasure. I've got to come in. Um, I think it's a pity that we, both the agent and on the uh, document that were before us, there's been this, um, the mix, the percentage mix of one, two, three, four bedrooms, and it hasn't been followed. I'm sorry that we cannot do this. It'd been lovely to have perhaps two two bedroom houses, particularly next to um, the um, long view, therefore making the probably bungalows, making it easier for them. Um, and one, three bed, two, four bedrooms and four, sorry, four, three bedroom ones and four, two bedroom ones, which have been a good mix. And pity that we cannot uphold these kind of mixes within development such as this, by making it very variable. But they, I, I would. And I, I think this is another instance of we give planning permission for such a, for this level of housing, and suddenly, oh, well, it's two years' time, and oh, yeah, why we'll do an Oliver Twist, we'll ask for more. And I must say, I'm going to be opposing this development. I think the original one was very good. Um, and I think this is, once again, we're wasting one and a half hour, one and a half years for development not to proceed because someone wants to be putting a little bit more housing in. And I think, I think um, Councillor Trapp, one of the things I've learned in planning is when something comes forward as outline, you should be very careful what you give or don't give. And I, and I think because we are now in a position where, frankly, we, we are probably going to agree to this uh, and uh, the existing permissions are already there. You know that and I know that. So we're going to go to the vote. Uh, those in favour of uh, the supporting the officer's opinion uh, with the refinement made by Councillor Jones and seconded by Councillor Brown. Well, those in favour of that action, please raise their hands. Will those against that motion please raise their hands? The motion is passed with seven votes in favour, one vote against, and no abstentions. So that that application is approved. Um, it's now according to my watch, uh, four twenty-two. I intend to have a comfort break now, and and reassemble sharp at forty uh, at four thirty which is about seven minutes time. Thank you.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or everybody. Um, we're about to start now, and uh, we've got the presentation on item number eight. Thank you, Chair. If you'd like to go ahead, Rachel. Uh, this is uh, land adjacent to 73 Fordham Road in Soham, uh, the construction of two detached dwellings, a new access drop curb and associated works. So the first slide here shows the site edged in red. Uh, the black line you can see is the development envelope. Um, and the next slide shows an aerial view of the site. Um, this slide shows some of the site pictures. Um, the top left-hand picture is taken from Fordham Road, uh, looking across the site towards the A142. Uh, the bottom left picture is taken from the proposed route of the public right of way um, and across the site towards the neighbouring dwelling. And the pictures on the right are views of the front of the site from across the road. Um, the application seeks outline consent for two detached dwellings um, with a new access drop curb and associated works. The only detailed matter for consideration at this stage is access. Um, the plan on the slide shows the indicative layout of the proposal. Um, so the main considerations uh, in this application are the principle of development, visual amenity, residential amenity, highway safety and parking, ecology, flood risk and drainage and climate change. Um, so the inspector for the appeal uh, reference on the screen Land seized to Broad P. Soham found that the strict application of Grove 2 was not justified in that case, given that the local plan anticipated housing in that location and at the market towns. This application site is lo located outside of the, the development envelope of Soham and is therefore contrary to Grove 2. However, the proposal is located in one of the three market towns where growth is directed by Grove 2. It's been carefully considered as to whether the circumstances of this application are similar to those in the appeal decision, and for the purpose of reaching a decision on this case alone, it is considered that the circumstances are similar, and therefore growth to is out of date in this case. Um, therefore, it's considered that the principle of development in this location on the edge of a market town is acceptable because the development envelope in this location is out of date and should not be strictly applied in the way that growth to intends. So on to visual impact, um, appearance, landscaping, layout and scale are not for consideration at this stage. Uh, the site is currently an undeveloped piece of grassland, which forms a gap in the linear development along Fordham Road. Um, the erection of two dwellings would change the character and appearance of the area by virtue of introducing built form in this location. However, this was once wider open land, which formed the transition from built form to the countryside but this has been eroded by the erection of the dwellings to the south, which have extended the built form. It does form a gap in the linear development, but this gap has been created through the erection of the dwellings to the south, and it's not considered that it provides any significant views or adds significantly to the level of visual amenity experienced in the public realm in that location. Uh, the red line doesn't extend all the way back to the A142, meaning the land beyond the red line will not be garden land, which is a similar situation to the dwellings both north and south of the site. Um, it's between two dwellings in, within an area that largely consists of residential dwellings. Uh, the dwellings on either side and across the road are largely single story in nature and from the indicative elevation and layout plans, the proposed dwellings would be similar in character as those to the south following the built form line of those dwellings while retaining undeveloped land to the rear. Um, landscaping is not for consideration at this stage. However, the block plan does show some indicative landscaping, which includes hedging around the perimeter of the site and some tree planting. Um, it's of a sufficient size and dwellings are proportionate to the plot and it is considered that an acceptable landscaping scheme can be achieved at the site. So it's considered an acceptable scheme could be achieved in this location without significant harm to the character and appearance of the area and is considered to comply with policies EMV1 and EMV2. Um, On to residential amenity. So it's in outline with all matters reserved except access and therefore it's not possible to fully um, assess the impacts of residential amenity. However, we need to be confident that a scheme can be achieved without a significant adverse impact. Um, the indicative layout shows the dwelling set back beyond the rear elevation of 73 Fordham Road. 
And in this location, it is considered unlikely the proposal would result in any significant impacts to the residential community of that dwelling. Given the proximity of plot two to the neighboring dwelling, 75 Fordham Road, it's considered there could be a potential for an overbearing impact to the bedroom window on the side elevation. And there is also a kitchen window proposed on the side elevation of plot two that looks towards 75 Fordham Road, which could result in overlooking. But as layout, scale and appearance are not for consideration, this may not be the final design. Um, it's considered that given the size of the site that these issues could be resolved and a scheme could be achieved without a significant adverse impact to residential amenity. Due to the site's proximity to the A142, uh, the Council's Environmental Health Officer has advised that an acoustic fence is required to aid with noise mitigation and details of this can be secured by condition. So highway safety and parking. Um, access is the only matter for which approval is sought at this stage. Um, the proposal will involve the creation of an access onto Fordham Road, a drop curb and the provision of the access will require the crossing on Fordham Road to be relocated. Um, the plans show that the proposed access will be situated to the south of the site. The access would serve both dwellings. The indicative plans show both a turning area for both dwellings and two parking spaces per dwelling, which are situated to the front of the dwellings. Um, the local highway authority have been consulted as part of the application and have commented that on the basis of the information submitted, that in highway terms, the proposed development is acceptable. Uh, the layout of the site is indicative at this stage. However, it does show the provision of two parking spaces per dwelling, and it's considered that the site is large enough to provide this and cycle parking. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next slide shows um, the proposed access arrangements in more detail, including the relocation of the crossing. So currently, it is in this location, and it would be moved to where the orange dots are. Um, regarding the public right of way, the public footpath runs um, through the proposed access. Um, it's the pink line on the plan. The application shows the intention to divert this footpath. Um, the diversion shown on the plans is how the public right of way actually appears on the ground. It's the pink strip yeah, that Tony's pointing to now. Um, the definitive map team at County Council have confirmed that uh, a diversion for the path must be formally made to them, but they've raised no objections to the proposal but they've requested a condition that a diversion order must be complete before any development takes place. So other matters, um, it's considered that the size is of a sufficient site that biodiversity net gain could be achieved and this could be secured by condition. Um, the site's in flood zone one, uh, not within an area of surface water flooding. Uh, no details of foul or surface water have been provided. However, these could be provided by condition. And currently no details have been put forward in respect of climate change, but this is outlined with all matters reserved except access and these details could be included as part of a reserved matters application. So in summary, the application is outside the development envelope. However, it is located in a market town and is an infill site between existing built form. In this specific case, growth two is considered to be out of date and therefore the principle of development in this location is acceptable. There's been no other significant harm identified, and it is considered that two dwellings could be achieved in this location without a significant detrimental impact to the character and appearance of the area, residential community, and highway safety. And it's considered that biodiversity net gain could be achieved at the site and is recommended for approval. Thank you very much. Can we have the applicant up again, please? Thank you, Chairman and members for allowing me to speak this afternoon. I'm the agent speaking on behalf of my client. This application has a support, the full support from the planning officer and there have been no objections from highways, parish council or neighbours. The application is being heard at committee as it is a departure from the development plan and no other material reason. The site is, is situated between residential development with dwellings either side and as such, this is a simple infill development. The development envelope adjacent to the site uh, is adjacent to the site and sits on the northern boundary. Technically, <clears throat> a public footpath runs through the site, but for many years now it's run alongside the site. We propose to formally divert this to represent the current setup. 
the definitive map team have raised no objection to this proposal. As highlighted within the planning officer's report, growth one and growth two of the local plan are considered to be out of date and therefore the principle of development in this location is acceptable. In accordance with the framework, planning permission should be granted unless any adverse impacts of doing so would significantly and detrimentally outweigh the benefit. This proposal makes much more efficient use of the site and would make a modest but important addition to the housing needs within the district, along with enhancing the street scene as you approach so on. NPPF paragraph 68 states that small and medium sized sites can make an important contribution to meeting the housing requirements of the area and are often built relatively quickly. Although only outline permission has been applied for, indicative layouts have been put forward illustrating single storey dwellings which would be in keeping with the area and provide a high level of demand due to the limited bungalows within the area. No new build bungalows are on the market within SOAM at present. The proposal, put, the proposal would help support local services and would provide a scheme of economic growth during construction. Paragraph 7 of the NF. PPF, NPPF explains that the purpose of the planning system is to contribute towards the achievement of sustainable development, described as being changed for the better. Decisions should be decisions should apply as a presumption in favour of sustainable development. Development is development in substan, sustainable locations should be approved. SOM has good services and facilities which need to be supported. This scheme does not cause any harm, and, is, and this is reflected by the support of the planning officer. And I ask that you support the recommendation of approval. Um, just to want to highlight, there's a bus stop obviously opposite the site. You've probably seen today, you've got a shop within 60 metres, public house within 600, and you've got the industrial estate within 600, which is walking or biking distance as well. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Could you just wait a second? Have you got any uh, questions? Local councillor. Thank Thanks you, Chair. Going. I don't know if it's just feeding my curiosity or not, but um, looking at the viability of this site, you're looking to um, move the uh, the um, crossing. Um, have you got a costing on that? Yeah, I've spoken to the highway department. And they're looking at about 50,000 to get that moved. 50, yeah. Right. Okay. Now, I just think I just make sure That's the viability fine, yeah. seems to rack up and... Yeah. Obviously, we can't ask whether you can develop the land behind it further to help cost it, but... Well, we, you've got to look at this one. I know. Today, unfortunately. Um, cheers. I, I, I think I'll uh, just assume you will have a question. Oh, all right. Okay, thank Could you. Could you limit it to one, please? Um, no. Um, but, it, it's, I mean, well, actually, it is a question. I think it's jolly good that you are actually thinking of putting a bungalow, two bungalows here. And, but I notice it's also outline planning permission. So will you come back and do a Oliver Twist in a year and a half's time, as you say, mm, well, we've got the outline planning permission. Let's put the high, higher buildings. Uh, well, that interest, I, I can't explain, but... There are all bungalows in that area, so I can't assume that the planners are going to accept one and a half or two storey in that location. Um, so at this stage, I think it's just single storey only. So, okay, so you, you say probably no Oliver Twist? Possibly. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Well, thank you very much indeed. That's the only speaker we have. So has the officer got any more comments? No further comments. Thank you, Chair. Have we got questions for officer? Councillor Wilson. Yes. Um, the Environmental Health talked about an acoustic fence. Where is the acoustic fence going to be placed? Um, so in uh, my office report i've said that we could um condition details of this um to be submitted but i would expect that it would go along the where the red line boundary is will be the back of the garden so we would expect it to go along that line uh, as it is in the next door site so but we would be expecting details of that to be received by discharge condition by condition yeah i'd like to ask a question in the uh... Uh, in the agenda here, it, we ref it refers to detached dwellings. Verbally, the applicant and in conversation with um, Councillor Trapper referred to single-storey dwellings. 
uh, I'm, uh, I, can you confirm that the application is for single storey dwellings? Um, so that's not in the description. Um, that's what's been put in as on the indicative elevations. They are only indicative. Um, so it would be, they could put in a uh, two storey at reserve matter stage, but it's unlikely we would support that given what's either side, but that is something we would have to assess at the time. But in the description, no, it is just two detached dwellings. Could, if the um, committee was minded to give approval to this and agree with the officer, would they be able to put in single storey or wording of that nature? We could add a condition that they had to be single storey. So we could condition Well, I mean, the, the applicant has said in a presentation to the committee that it's single storey. Yeah, so we could we could add, add a condition on to say that they had to we be single storey. We could add a commission, yeah. yeah, when we get to it. Okay, um, we've got questions to officers, in which case we go to debate. Members, Christine. I was just saying, uh, just thinking, um, it would be brilliant if you would be possible to um, condition for single storey dwellings. I have hideous problems with stairs. I couldn't now live in a ordinary house and I, I don't believe that I can be the only we, We've person. had an answer from the officer yeah. to say we can yeah. condition it. Well, I was just say, saying how important it is because there are so few bungalows usually. Uh, I, appreciate, I, I appreciate that and uh, First of all, we'll go to Councillor Jones and then Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair. I'm no. Bill Smith. I'm sorry. There's another David. I beg your pardon. You're at the top of the list. Unusually, Chair, I cannot agree with my wife's or your uh, suggestion that we do stipulate a single story buildings. That's all I'll say. So I dare say, you're, you're, you're most, a lot of people disagree with me, Councillor Ambrose Smith. And... Yes, but I was disagreeing with my wife. So it's... Okay, so we're now on debate and we're on Councillor Brown. I'm looking at my list, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Chair. No, I'm in agreement with the other two councillors. They have yet to propose it and I'm quite happy to propose it. Um, if you can put that, make a note of that. Being as it's, I know it's not technically my ward, but it is so. Um, uh, but I agree with the relevant conditions about um, recommend uh, for single story development. So you're you're proposing that. So you're proposing agreeing with the officer recommendation, but something to button it up so that it is single story. Yes. Okay, and you have a seconder. Yes. Uh, Councillor Brown is seconding it. Is there anybody who is, is there, uh, have I got the feeling of the membership? Councillor Trapp. Just like to make the comment, it's so nice to be able to have a building development in um, flood zone one. I mean, you know, I, I thought they were all used up in, in, in this district. That we don't have any room for, you know, it's all flood zone three. Such, so, such a, so, so I share your delight. Thank um, you very much. Uh, now we go on to is there any more debate? No, well we have a we have a proposal from Councillor Jones, seconded by Councillor Brown, uh, and that is to accept the officer's recommendation, but I don't know how we're going to word exactly this that we know, we note the statement by the applicant that it's a single story or you can we just something? delegate it to officers? Does. Yep, yes, you can, yeah. So I would say that you would be going for the officer recommendation with an additional condition for uh, restricted to single storey dwellings with the wording delegated to the officers. Okay, so if, if uh, I think it's time to go to the vote on that one. So those in favour of th that uh, proposal by Councillor Jones, please raise their hand. Is that unanimous? That's unanimous in favour. I, I thought we were having some dispute in the Ambrose Smith camp. Thank you, Councillor Travis.
it, it's a, Isabella's not here. And, pardon? You're taking over this one. Yeah, you? sorry, Chair, you've got me again. Okay, but, uh, let's see. Okay, Tony, your presentation, please. Thank you, Chair. So we are at um, 10 Dexter Lane, Littleport. So item nine, application 22 oblique 01474 oblique form. And it is for the erection of a fence and it is retrospective. So obviously we were at the site earlier today. As you can see, the site is outlined in, in red here. And obviously it's quite a new development, so it hasn't actually got on our aerial photos yet, but 